systems across the United States have experienced major service disruptions, some lasting as long as eight hours. On Capitol Hill Wednesday, in response to those system failures, a House subcommittee held a hearing on telephone service reliability, featuring representatives from the Federal Communications Commission and regional telephone companies. Next, on C-SPAN 2, we'll bring you coverage of that hearing held by the Government Information, Justice and Agriculture Subcommittee of the House Government Operations Committee. The chairman of the subcommittee is Representative Robert Wise, Jr., Democrat of West Virginia. The subcommittee's ranking Republican member is Congressman Al McCandless of California. Justice and Agriculture Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, today's public hearing is on the Federal Communications Commission efforts to assure reliability of the public telephone network. On June the 26, 1991, Washington, D.C., much of Maryland and West Virginia, major portions of uh, my home state were paralyzed by a massive failure in the public telephone network. Local telephone service pretty much shut down for seven hours. This network failure turned out to be one of several that have occurred within the past month. Let me run through those very quickly. June 10th of this year, a network failure in Pacific Bell Territory, evident result of a software problem. June 26th of this year, on the same day as the failure in the Atlantic region, service in Southern California was disrupted for nearly three hours. The causes of the problems on both coasts appeared similar. July 1st of this year, Pittsburgh and other parts of Pennsylvania experienced network disruptions seemingly identical to the ones of the east and west coast in the previous week. These, this outage lasted approximately six hours. On the same day, service was reported lost in San Francisco for several minutes, evidently due to the same type of failure. This incident has been described as a near miss. Also on the same day, a computer problem interrupted telephone service to Greensboro, South Carolina. July 2nd of this year, telephones in Pittsburgh again disabled for apparently the same reason as the earlier coast failures. Other outages preceded these in Hinsdale, Illinois, and in, in, in outages among the long distance companies. The American people are concerned. During the time the phones were down, modern life as we know it almost ground to a halt. People with medical emergencies could not contact doctors or hospitals. Patients unable to parents were unable to reach their children's daycare centers. Businesses had no way to call clients. One of the local stockbrokers in our area estimates during the outage that he lost $25,000 in commercial business. Multiply that across the region and then across the country and you can see the implications of these type of outages. No one, uh, everyone was affected somehow. Some people even couldn't, failed to have their pizzas delivered. Some 12 million Americans were reminded of just how much we rely on the public telephone network. As a society that is increasingly dependent on telecommunications, we cannot afford failures like those of the past two weeks. And yet, as technology becomes more sophisticated and network systems more interdependent, the likelihood of recurrent failures increases. It's not as though there wasn't warning that this would happen. Over two years ago, the National Research Council, working under the arm, as an arm of the National Academy of Science, published a report, The Growing Vulnerability of the Public Switched Networks, Implications for National Security and Emergency Preparedness. While this report deals with the national security implications, it also points out the economic implications and the implications for modern life. It also points out and warns about problems in the switching systems and makes the point well that as technology increases, so will our problems increase. And, take, and this report makes special recommendations that could have a, possibly have averted much of the disruption that occurred. Today's hearing will focus on this report and what relationship it had and what it could still have and what the Federal Communications Commission did in reviewing this report, how the Federal Communications Commission acted, how the Com Federal Communications Commission intends to act in the future to make sure that we don't suffer uh, future disruptions of this nature. I picked up the morning paper today and was happy to see, I think, that there was an explanation given by the um, uh, software producer, the vendor, that explaining what uh, the cause was and saying that they thought it could be, could be rectified. I hope they're correct, and we're going to get into that in this hearing. But my concern, and I think the concern of a lot of people is, is there a pattern here, and a pattern that needs to be investigated thoroughly. 
We are, and finally, I would like to say that I believe that this is a national problem. It is true that the, the outages occurred by region. They occurred within the CNP systems of Bell Atlantic. They occurred within the region of Pacific uh, 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 Telesis. But I'm concerned that, that while regional, the problems are national in scope and therefore invokes the jurisdiction of the Federal Communications Commission as well as that of the various state public service commissions. We are honored to have testifying before us today Representative John Bryan of Texas, who has legislation pending that speaks to many of these issues. We will also have with us John C. McDonald, the president of MBX Incorporated. Mr. McDonald chaired a committee of the National Research Council that published the report that I referred to. We will also have testifying Richard Firestone, chief of the Federal Communication Commission's Common Carrier Bureau. And we will hear from Howard Davenport, soon to be sworn in as chairman of the District of Columbia Public Service Commission. We will hear testimony from Bell Atlantic and Pacific Bell, as well as from DSC, the manufacturer of the switching technology involved in most of the recent outages. And finally, we will have Theodore Weintraub, who handles 9-11-911 emergency service from Montgomery County Police Department. I understand that Mr. Weintraub has a bigger story to tell about interruptions in emergency service than may have already been reported. This hearing uh, uh, has been called quickly and been worked on it extensively during the past week because of the severe nature of, uh, of the problems. Let me say that I appreciate those who have been cooperative with this committee as they have tried to put this hearing together. I'm concerned about some who have not been as cooperative. I'm happy to see that we have everybody under the tent today. Uh, to the Federal Communication Commission, we are happy, of course, that you are here and we look forward to hearing from Mr. Firestone. I'm disappointed in your response and lack of cooperation as we put this hearing together and was prepared as of yesterday morning to issue a subpoena or to seek to have a subpoena issued had you not appeared. Uh, I think that the American people want to know what is happening. They're concerned about a recurring pattern. They want to know what their government is doing as well as what the private sector is doing, and it's incumbent upon the Federal Communication Commission to help supply those answers. Happily, we have everybody now in the room that needs to be in the room. This will be the first of a series of hearings, and I look forward to hearing the testimony and seeing what we can learn about how this happened, but more significantly, what's being done today, and even more significantly, what's going to be done tomorrow to make sure it doesn't recur again. Uh, at this time, I turn to Mr. McCandless for any opening statement he might wish to make. Mr. McCandless, if I could ask you to yield just further. I'd like to thank very much uh, our respective staffs for pulling this hearing together. Uh, Lee Godown, Audrey Bashkin, and, and Joe Shoemaker on our side, and I particularly want to express my appreciation to the minority for your assistance as we put this hearing together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have with us this morning the full, full committee ranking minority leader, Mr. Frank Horton, whom I will yield to for his statement. Uh, thank you, and, and Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Wise and Mr. McCandless, I'm pleased to join you today for this very important hearing on recent major telephone system failures in the Mid-Atlantic region in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. I have a crowded schedule this morning and can't stay too long, but I wanted to stop by and commend both of you for your leadership in pursuing this issue. This is an important subject. The telephone system failures that occurred on June 26 affected millions of Americans. It was made very clear to all of us on that day just how great a man Alexander Graham Bell really was. Most of the affected population still does not know or understand exactly what caused their phones to stop working. I know I don't. This hearing should provide some answers. I know, too, that you plan to pursue policy implications that might exist as well. For example, are we moving too fast with software refinements? Are there safeguards in place to monitor the system so that the disruptions can be prevented uh, or kept to a minimum? This is exactly the right place to pursue this issue. The wise McCandless team is a good one, indeed one of the best. This subcommittee does excellent work, and this issue of telecommunications fits squarely into its jurisdiction over the Federal Communications Commission. This brings me to the other, perhaps more important reason for my appearance today. I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for moving into the area of telecommunications. The area is an open frontier of policies not yet decided, laws not yet written, problems not yet solved. And the decision that our government makes on communications policy will affect every American. We need more oversight of this field, and I'm therefore here to commend you not only for this hearing, but to encourage you to explore other critical communication issues facing us now and on the horizon. 
On my subcommittee, Chairman Conyers and I are pursuing telecommunication policies at the international level through the Government Procurement Code and other trade policies. Telecommunications is an area that demands greater oversight by the Congress. It's one that I hope becomes a priority for the Government Operations Committee, and this, of course, is the Government Operations Subcommittee of primary jurisdiction. I look forward to reviewing the testimony presented today, and I thank you. I thank the witnesses for their participation. And again, Chairman Weiss, Mr. McCannis, I commend both of you for the leadership you've, you've shown. We thank you very much, Mr. Horton, and for the interest that you've shown in this issue and in other issues that the subcommittee has taken up. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have no statement. I think your opening statement uh, covered adequately what we need to use uh, in addressing the beginning of this uh, hearing. Thank you. Um, Mr. Peterson, no statement. Mr. Schiff? No statement. Okay. At this point, then, we're delighted to hear from our colleague, uh, Representative John Bryant from Texas. John is a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, and also a member of the Telecommun Telecommunications Subcommittee, has been very active in this field. And, John, we're delighted to have you uh, with us today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief because I know you want to get to the uh, invited witnesses this morning. But I wanted to come by and first congratulate you for having called a briefing today or a hearing today to examine the state of our nation's telecommunications network and the service outages which have been in the news recently. As you know, one of the companies involved, uh, the DSC uh, Communications Corporation, is a company from the region which I represent in the Congress, and I'm very proud to represent them. They make signaling systems that are literally the hub of many parts of the nation's telephone system. And it's a system that is designed and operated by many different telecommunications companies working in close concert in a very uh, complex and sophisticated system. With the multiplicity of network equipment providers, it would be careless I think it has been careless to suggest that any one company may be solely responsible for these outages. Indeed, while, these, uh, while this, this recent outage was a serious one, there have been no less than three additional major uh, outages prior to the events of June the 26th. These outages involved DSC's competitors, uh, other manufacturers of com communications products, and other service providers around the country. One of them uh, was so severe as to result in the closing of the New York Stock Exchange not very long ago. Since many companies are involved, I think that in our inquiry with regard to this matter, we should expect that many companies will help lead us to the solutions. And hopefully today, the inquiries will be focused on remarks and questions about what we know about the outages since June the 26th, rather than what is uh, speculative. I'm pleased, Mr. Chairman, that you've asked a DSC to participate. I think you'll be impressed, as I have been, that over the past decade they have been responsible for enormous accomplishments in the area of telecommunications equipment manufacturing. And I'm confident that you'll come away with a better appreciation of the complexities involved in providing uh, components for the telecommunications system that makes our country operate. As you know, this is a highly competitive area. We have seen a number of companies enter the field and then leave again uh, rapidly. DSC is not one of those companies. It is the second largest fully American-owned telecommunications equipment supplier with a history of technological achievement. We have watched in the Dallas area this firm grow from having just a small group of employees to now, 15 years ago, to now having over 4,000 employees, over 1,000 of which are highly skilled uh, telecommunications engineers. This is an unfortunate situation that we're facing. I'm hopeful that as we proceed, we'll take, keep in mind the important achievements that companies like this have made and the complexities that they face every day and the fact that this has happened before and unless we do something about it, I think it could easily happen again. I will not burden this committee with a long recitation of the details of legislation which I've introduced, which is now pending in the telecommunications subcommittee to address this problem, except to say that um, uh, changes in the regulatory mechanisms that have been put into place uh, at the federal and sometimes state level, I think, uh, are increasingly threatening the uh, security, that is to say the reliability of our telecommunications system uh, nationally. Uh, I think that it's clear we're going to have to react legislatively. Both the changes and the potential changes uh, in the um, modified final judgment governing the activities of the Bell operating companies, as well as the method of regulating prices of our telecommunications companies, and negatively alter the incentives which these companies have uh, to maintain a uniform quality of service. We need a mechanism which will operate prospectively, 
and not retrospectively to fix problems which might arise as a result of price caps as a method of regulation or changes in the modified final judgment or other changes. The legislation is pending, which I've introduced and which is co-sponsored by a number of, of my colleagues to require the FCC to establish, impose, and enforce local exchange carrier network quality standards so we can assure uh, the nation that the components being plugged in around the country are components that are going to make our system work and not components that are going to result uh, in the kind of outages that we saw uh, recently and that we've seen, we've seen uh, prior to the June 26 events as well. Uh, I don't think it's uh, valuable for me to go into the details surrounding that legislation except to make the point that the changes that are taking place with regard are being proposed with regard to the mod modified final judgment and have taken place with regard to price regulation uh, are a disincentive to continued, uh, I think, uniformity of quality in the telecommunications system. We need to address that. Legislation is pending to address it. I hope your subcommittee will take, an, take a look at that as well as uh, for, the, for the prospective value of it, as well as looking retrospectively at the uh, outages that have taken place. And I appreciate very much your letting me come by and take some of your time to make these introductory remarks. We appreciate your coming by, and uh, I want to say that your, your uh, legislation suddenly becomes very timely in light of what's happened and indeed much of the focus of today's hearing and, and others to come will, f uh, will be in, on what the FCC does, what they have done in the past, but most importantly what it is, as you say prospectively, what it is they're going to be doing in the future. And we hope to hear from the Federal Communications Commission today that they're approaching this uh, uh, with a new, a new vision and that they're going to be looking at the area of uh, standards and trying to head some of these problems in ways that they can help head some of these problems off before they start. As I say, I think that they, the Federal Communications, Federal Communications Commission has had ample warning to report such as this that these type of outages could occur. So we appreciate very much uh, your being here and uh, you've got me reading your legislation uh, now very thoroughly. If I'm not a co-sponsor, I'll probably be on by the end of the day, John. Um, Mr. McCandless, any questions? Uh, just, just one question for Mr. Bryant. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you would be establishing quality standards which is a very important key element of our hearing today. How does your bill establish this? Who, who would actually provide the technical information for the purpose of establishing quality standards? The bill would establish a federal state joint board which is given the task of recommending detailed standards for adoption by the FCC and the state public utility commissions. And the FCC would be directed to establish, impose, and enforce local exchange carrier network quality standards necessary to guarantee uniformity and quality. Uh, that's, that's an excellent combination. I guess what I'm looking for here is where would the technical information come from or originate from which these standards would be established? It would come from the Federal State Joint Board. Uh, uh, hopefully, well, as you know... The board would not be technical, though, Mr. Bryant. It would be uh, administrative in nature. I'm sorry, the board? Wouldn't it? The board? Uh, is the makeup of the board uh, engineers, people who work in this uh, activity on a daily basis? It would be made up of experts uh, who would be represented, uh, representative of the telecommunications industry. The okay. purpose of it would be to give the FCC specific detailed recommendations. Uh, obviously, I don't, we can't expect them to go a, a certain distance with regard to technical expertise, but I think that they're going to they're need the kind of recommendations which this board could could make uh, in order to be uh, practical as well as to be technologically correct, and that's that's our purpose. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Any questions, Mr. Schiff? I have no questions. Okay. We thank, thank you, you very Chairman. much, Mr. Bryant, for for appearing. Before we begin, and I call the next witness, let me just quickly go over the procedure that the subcommittee will use. Uh, there are many of you waiting to testify. We have a uh, long and I hope fruitful day ahead of us. Uh, the procedure I would ask is that all witnesses make their, contain their opening remarks to five minutes. Your written statements in their entirety have already been made a part of the record. If you've not submitted written testimony, uh, your written testimony that you do submit will be made part of the record. So there's no need to read the testimony. I would ask that you summarize, preferably in, about f in a five-minute period. The members of the subcommittee will operate also under a, a, a f flexible five-minute rule which is that each member will have five minutes of questions. I would ask um, witnesses if they could contain their answers as much as possible so we can get the most questions in. In areas of interest, we will go back for a second round of questions if necessary. Uh, 
It is also the practice of this subcommittee, so as not to prejudice any witness that may ever appear before it, to swear in all witnesses that appear. And so I will be asking uh, every witness that appears, as I ask every witness that ap has appeared at every meeting that I've ever chaired, to, uh, uh, to be sworn in. Um, so having said that, I will call the f first panel, uh, which is John C. McDonald, the president of the MBX, Corp uh, MBX Incorporated, Mr. McDonald. And if you would just remain standing and raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I will. Mr. McDonald, we look forward to your remarks, and please feel free to summarize in any way you see fit. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify on this most critical topic, the vulnerability of our nation's telecommunications networks. My message is quite direct. First, society relies absolutely on smoothly functioning communications networks and thus the consequences of network failure have become increasingly severe. Second, our public switch networks are becoming more, not less, vulnerable to disruption because of new technology and certain regulatory trends. Third, we can reduce these growing vulnerabilities by taking a scientific approach to the problem. What is happening to public networks to make them less dependable? A report from the National Research Council issued more than two years ago forecasted growing vulnerability and identified four major causes. First, economies of scale have driven designers to concentrate traffic into larger switches, higher capacity cables using fiber optic technology, and centralized signaling causing an element failure to have greater disruptive scope. Second, software technology has led to increased network flexibility, but at the same time, it has brought a significant challenge to overall network reliability because of the crash potential. Third, fewer forms of technology diversity now exist, such as microwave radio and satellites. And fourth, certain regulatory trends force network designers uh, to make uh, decisions on network design which cause them to be more vulnerable. Looking back at the major outages which have occurred over the past several years, I am struck by our inability to describe their magnitude in any quantitative sense. We could say that the Hinsdale outage was, quote, the worst disaster ever, unquote, or that the nationwide AT&T failure was, quote, simply awful, unquote. I have heard the recent Washington, D.C. failure described as, quote, just terrible, unquote. I find that these qualitative descriptions symptomatic of a gap in our scientific approach to the problem. Scientists have always found more precise ways to describe events in the past. Massive failures will not go away unless we make it so through a scientific approach to the problem. We are much better off as a society now that we can distinguish between an earthquake of 4.2 and 7.4 on the Richter scale. Standards can be set for anticipated stress levels and designs to meet these stresses can be tested using the scientific principles underlying precise measurement. I have considered many alternatives for describing network failure and propose a scale based on a new unit of measure called the EULE. The EULE is an acronym which stands for User Lost Erlang. And Erlang is a standard unit of traffic measurement. One Erlang represents a telephone call lasting for one hour. The EULE has the following attributes. First, it describes the impact of a network outage on the end user and therefore takes network redundancy, or lack thereof, into account. Second, it is easy to understand and describe as opposed to other measures, for example, network availability. Third, I have defined it to be logarithmic, so a limited set of numbers can describe a large range of events. I have ranked significant network outages in the United States during the past five years. The nationwide failure of AT&T's network in January 1990 registered an estimated 6.3 Yules, slightly above the Hinsdale fire which registered 6.0. However, the recent signaling system number seven failure 
in Washington registered an estimated 6.6 .6 ewells and is therefore the worst failure that I'm aware of. This means that users lost over 1 million Erlang of network use. Having now defined a scale of measurement, what should a national standard be for network dependability? It is within the power of telecommunications engineers to design public networks to an arbitrary level of dependability. Considering the national network, I propose a new standard in addition to those already established for network elements such as subscriber loops and central office switching system. This standard is at the network level. In my view, networks should be designed to be as reliable as central office switching and therefore should not contribute more than three Yules per year. That is, no set of network failures should result in a user experienced outage of more than 1,000 user hours per year. In conclusion, we have been very successful in building networks which support ever-increasing societal needs, but somewhere along the way, we have dropped our guard when it comes to overall network dependability. To regain this lost ground, I feel that we need to take a scientific approach to the problem and develop a new scale on which to measure network dependability. In addition, a new standard for dependability is needed to guide network designers. If we cannot specify a quality level for public networks and measure it, we will drift toward ever lower levels of dependability. Management by objective is a recognized approach to success. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for your interest and for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. McDonald, and we appreciate uh, your participation. Uh, for the record, let me just uh, note you were the chair of the Committee on Review of Switching, Synchronization, and Network Control in National Security Telecommunications. Is that correct? That's correct. And is this a copy of the report that your body uh, it issued? Is. I have yes. one myself. And titled Growing Vulnerability of the Public Switch Networks. Were you at the time that you were chair of this the chairman of the Con Contel Corporation? I, I was not chairman of Contel. I was the chief scientist for Contel. I see. And uh, so you've had some background then in the area of switching, I would presume. Uh, I've been involved in telecommunications network design for 25 years. You've mentioned the dangers in the setup uh, uh, that you've described. My question would be, first, this report, which is titled, uh, which says implications for national security, the first thing when I think of national security is I think of a nuclear disaster or something along those lines. But is this report relevant? to the outages that occurred. Yes, it is. Uh, we felt that uh, national security included economic security. And we felt that the growing vulnerability not only affected our national defense posture, but also our national economic posture. And in the report, you mentioned certain dangers in the, the existing uh, system. Could you reiterate what you feel are the most significant dangers and what role you see the FCC playing to alleviate these dangers? Well, the most significant danger is, of course, the denial of dial tone or the denial of the ability of users to use this network that they become dependent upon. Uh, and, and when we published the report, uh, there was only the sketchiest of, 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 of uh, facts on which to base what we thought was going to happen. Uh, subsequent to the publishing of our report, I think that our are uh, looking into the crystal ball as to what might happen has now been uh, has now been confirmed, and there is a growing vulnerability, uh, and and this growing vulnerability is going to continue to to cause uh, economic disruption. What do you why, what do you see as the causes of the growing vulnerability? I uh, in my testimony I, I raised uh, the the points that that were uh, causing this first. Economies of scale are forcing network designers to concentrate ever larger numbers of users into a single network element. If that element fails, it affects a much larger scope of people. Uh, central offices are getting very, very big. A fiber optic cable carries a massive amount of traffic so that if one cable is cut, as occurred this year in, in Newark, it denied uh, service to 60 percent of lower Manhattan which caused the mercantile exchange to go uh, to close down. Uh, it uh, caused uh, the tra air traffic control facilities in, in not only in the New York area, but Washington area to, to, uh, to stop. Uh, and and the, uh, so the, the, the first point is that the concentration of these uh, uh, 
traffic into fewer network elements is one reason. A second reason is that, that we're using software technology. This is a technology that's very difficult to debug. Uh, it's a technology, there are millions of lines of code, and, and uh, I'm a, a practicing engineer, I'm a professional engineer in the state of California. Uh, I can attest to the fact that these, this software is impossible to fully test. And you can't fully test it until it's in service. And then if it's in service, people are dependent upon it, and then's when it finally gets tested. I don't see this changing in the foreseeable future. So what we need to have is backups, backup systems to these, uh, these software areas. Uh, third, the third reason is that there is, there are fewer forms of technology diversity. We used to have microwave radio. The microwave radio uh, hops have now been taken out of service and in, 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 uh, uh, fiber optic used. We used to carry a lot of traffic on satellites domestically. That's not being done. And fourth, and maybe this is very significant, there are regulatory trends right now that are forcing networks to be less reliable. Could, could you expand on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, and also report, would you mention where those trends are coming from, of state or federal level? Uh, the trends uh, are coming from, from two sources. They're coming from uh, the courts of the United States. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Judge Green uh, and his MFJ decisions. And they're coming from the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, one example that, that I'm particularly alarmed about is mentioned in this report, uh, and, and that is open network architecture. Open network architecture is a concept not yet implemented, and this is why we're saying it's a growing vulnerability. The net, the, if you think the network is, is bad today, it's going to get worse unless something's done. And, and one of those causes to make it worse will be open network architecture. Can you imagine the software that we have difficulty testing today being opened up to the world for their own use, to private individuals? They're called enhanced service providers. The open network architecture concept allows that software to be accessed by the whole world. And if it screws up the software, the switch will crash. I think this is a very unwise concept. And, and uh, in many cases, there are regulatory decisions that are made that seem nice architecturally, uh, but the, the, fa the basic fact is that vul network vulnerability is not considered at all in this type of regulatory decision making, and it should be. Mr. McDonald, when the National Research Council published the report that we've been talking about, the implications for national security emergency preparedness and the growing vulnerability of the public switch networks, it, the report warned of massive system failures in the nation's phone network. Was the Federal Communications Commission made aware of your findings? Yes, they were. In fact, we had the uh, Federal Communications Commission meet with my committee uh, and, and testify about how they saw the network uh, moving and, and uh, they were well aware of, of the work of the committee. Uh, when the report was, was published, the FCC was, of course, uh, uh, d distributed a copy of it, and, and therefore uh, they were fully aware of both uh, the operations of the committee during its stages of hearings and then of the final report. Did the Federal Communications Commission give you any reaction to the report? Uh, I have not had any personal reaction from the Federal Communications Commission. They could have contacted others. They could have contacted others at at the National Research Council, they could have contacted the sponsor of this report, which was the Defense Communications Agency. And I'd really like to commend the Defense Communications Agency for their wisdom in sponsoring uh, this report, the, the work that went into this report. Was this report distributed to the various telephone companies in our nation, and particularly the uh, Bell operating companies? Uh, I'm, I, I can't tell you the precise distribution, but there were over a thousand copies of this report published, and I'm sure they went to Belcor and to the, uh, the other telephone companies. In fact, many of them were represented on my committee. AT&T was represented on my committee, as was General Telephone uh, and uh, Contel. Uh, so, so there was wide, there was representation on the committee by telephone companies, and the report was widely disseminated. Uh, I wrote uh, 
an op-ed piece. The, the Academy asked me to write an op-ed piece about the report, and it was published in 86 newspapers. And did the, to your knowledge, did the regional bell operating companies uh, participate uh, in any way uh, with your committee? Yes, they did. We had uh, uh, representatives from Bellcor and other operating companies come and, and testify before my committee. And did you receive, uh, after the report was published, did you receive any reaction from the telephone uh, industry, and particularly the telephone companies? I think the reaction was uh, uh, that the report is overstated, uh, that these things can't happen, that the network is, is solid, this won't happen. Uh, a major effort occurred between uh, my committee and, and NSTAC, which is the advisor to the president, the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. Uh, that committee uh, took issue with our report, uh, uh, and, and there are the, the chairman of, of the, the major telephone companies are on this committee, as well as, as um, other uh, representatives from uh, industry. And in general, uh, the NSTAC uh, uh, said that the, the, there is no foundation on which to base these conclusions that are in the report. Uh, we met with them for a large period of time. Uh, I think they modified their position slightly after the, at the conclusion of our discussions, but I think they still felt that we were, uh, we were uh, chicken little, the sky is falling. And do you think that in light of what's happened in the past month that your report has been vindicated? Well, not just the last month, but I think when AT&T had its major outage in January 1990, which also, I might say, was a signaling system number seven problem. And, and I support uh, Mr. Bryant's comment that, uh, that uh, what happened uh, recently with, with DSC and SS7 can happen to any uh, supplier of, of a signaling system. The concept itself is a centralized concept using highly intense computing. And there is no one that can guarantee that this system will not fail. It will fail. It will continue to fail. And anyone who tells you it's not going to fail again doesn't know what they're talking about. It will fail, and what's important is that we develop a backup to this because it's going to continue to fail. Thank you. My time has uh, certainly expired, and I turn to Mr. McCandless. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McDonald, we, if I understand the system correctly, we have uh, certain stages from the person who picks up the phone. Yes, sir to what I'm going to call a substation. Now, you have more sophisticated language for that, which in turn goes to some type of a regional center from there to the next main step, be wherever it is. Yes, sir. There is a hierarchy of yeah. switching in the network. Uh, it is also my understanding that in designing this basic system that I've talked about, that there are are uh, backup systems involved? There's redundancy in each of the individual nodes. Yeah. So that if, if there is a problem in the one, I'm going to call it again, regional, that over here, a few miles away, you have a duplicate of that capable of taking the load from the one that has failed uh, without any problems, quote unquote, until such time as uh, it's back online, and then they do a 50-50 sharing that, of the load. That's a nice theory, but that's not the way the network is today. Right. So what, what you're telling me is that, that this backup system is not really fully capable of backing up. That's correct. If that was the case, sir, we would not have any outage that affected end users. Uh, right. No, we, we need to separate outages into two categories. If a backhoe goes through some cable, that's something that nobody can design uh, into a system or out of a system. Oh yes, yes. You, you could design uh, you could design a network with diversity so that if a backhoe cuts a cable here, using the ideas you already described, there's enough capacity right, right, to go right, there. Uh, okay, uh, I, I stand corrected. I guess what I was talking about a principal line from point A to point B is going to interrupt service if a backhoe goes through it. Yes. But there, there is theoretically the backup system. Theoretically. Which is the overriding factor here. And so even though we cut the line, uh, we sw the switching process uh, moves to the backup. Now, going back to where we were, the backup systems 
that are currently designed, and I'm going to say the newest technology because, as I understand it, uh, the system is in various stages of upgrading. The newest designs installed for backup system purposes, uh, in your opinion, are not adequately designed to handle what it is that uh, would be required of a system if part of the system were non-functional. That's correct. Can you explain that? What, what well, is let's take SS7, for example. In, which is in layman's language, so that I would understand. Uh, um, the chairman is very adept in this. He, he <laughs> deals in telephones in West Virginia all the time. So he. Let me just say a few words about how signaling occurs in a telephone network. In the old days, we used to have multi-frequency senders and receivers. Now, these are, are devices like your touchtone telephone. Uh, a, a digit one is represented by two tones, a digit two is represented by two different tones. And the way signaling used to occur in a telephone network, and the signaling is the means by which calls are set up and taken down, the way signaling used to occur are that the frequencies were emitted along the hierarchy that you described of the network from, from point A to point B to point C to point D. And this is the way it used to work. And there was no single sender or receiver that if it failed that could possibly take a network down. In our great wisdom we've chosen a new concept now called signaling system number seven. It's, and it's a common channel signaling approach whereby the computers in the individual uh, offices in this hierarchy send their information to a common point in order to establish a path. Now, if this common point fails, the network crashes. So what was impossible 10 years ago is now possible. And that's why we have a growing vulnerability today. OK. Um, let's draw a parallel here with respect to quality control. We've had some rather sad experiences in the NASA program, all centered around a problem of quality control. It, are we, uh, in, in your comments, you talked about uh, a forced into a position of, uh, I forgot your exact words, but what it meant was too much too soon without enough backup engineering uh, involved. Those are my words, not yours. Do we have a parallel to our NASA program where uh, we're putting things online too quickly, even though we think they're going to be operating properly, and as a result, we're now having failures com comparable to failures that uh, the NASA experienced where lives were lost or, or missions were scrubbed? Uh, I, I think that the analogy is, is there. I'll give the example of the Hinsdale fire. The Hinsdale fire caused such a large disruption because there, there was so much traffic that was concentrated into a single, what's called a point of presence. And the point of presence was a, a concept developed because of deregulation of AT&T. One had to have a place in the network to allow all the competing carriers to come. And the FCC set out, mandated, a, a time frame on which uh, the local telephone companies had to provide equal access. And this forced them into decision making to concentrate traffic into a single point. And it turned out there was a fire at that single point causing a ma ma major outage. And, and I think that the, the interval that was given for the local exchange carriers to develop equal access was much too short. And because of this type of rulemaking, we had the Hinsdale fire cause a, a major, major outage that disrupted uh, a, a large area for weeks. And so I think, it, yes, there, that there is a parallel between some of the uh, issues of forcing a, a time frame onto a technology that technology can't properly absorb. Back to the time frame. Was this a, a judicial action? requiring that this take place? I'm not sure whether it was judicial or whether it was just uh, regulatory. I believe it was just regulatory. The, the uh, timeline I'm talking about now, yes. with respect to being able to offer all of these things which created the problem that you outlined. 
I, I believe it was just the FCC that chose the time frame uh, and it was not, legislate, was not legislated. From your knowledge, was there any review process there uh, with those who were going to be responsible for providing this service? Uh, I, I'm not qualified to comment on that, sir. Uh, I, I'm sure there was a review process. I'm sure there was some element of due diligence. But I'm also sure that, that uh, this concept of, of an entire network failure was not properly brought to people's attention at that time. Uh, it's, this is a new idea. That's why I'm proposing the new unit of measure, the Yule, and a new national quality standard, because the things that are occurring today could not happen 10 years ago. So we're dealing with a new phenomena in terms of, of, a, of a large network outage. So uh, when, we, when we talk in terms of, uh, of requirements, with the knowledge you have, you're not sure that that these, these um, requirements, that, that something be in place by a certain time, uh, went through a hearing process, went through a, a review process, went through an appeal process, which would adequately uh, permit those who had the responsibility both to engineer and, and to install. I'm, uh, I'm not sure that I could comment on that pr right. process, whether it was adequate or not. I sense that my five minutes has uh, gone by. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Canlis. Uh, Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McDonald, I don't pretend to understand the technical aspects of the problems that you describe, but my uh, former law office was located about 150 miles from Hinsdale. So uh, I, I know the practical consequences of, of the things that you describe. And I do have a little knowledge of the law of entropy, I think which I think says that things start out in a relatively orderly fashion and get progressively chaotic. Uh, and we see commercials on television these days about the wonderful benefits of fiber optics and how you can run thousands of signals through one small cable and then you come and testify to the practical effect of that if, if something goes wrong. Uh, and, and I think you described your, quote, new standard as one that is as reliable as the old central office switching, switching system. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now, how, how will the back, and, and as I understand, the way that will occur, uh, theoretically, is that there will be backup systems that will be able to route around any problem that arises. Uh, is the uh, hardware in place for that to occur, or does that hardware have to be installed? That hardware has to be installed. Uh, just in, in, the, in the time frame that we're talking about, our report was issued two years ago to a very skeptical audience. And, and I think it's taken this period of time up to now to, and to, for the industry to say, yes, this can now happen. All right, so we're at the point now where we can say it can happen, now what are we going to do about it? So we're at the point now of saying what are we going to do about it? And, and that's why I'm proposing that we take a scientific approach, recognize it's going to happen, set quality standards, design the quality standards, test the quality standards, put in the redundancy that's required to meet those standards, and in essence take a scientific approach to the fact that networks can fail. Have you uh, or anyone working with you had an opportunity to evaluate the cost of uh, installation and ultimate functioning of this backup system? No, sir. Do you have any wild guess as it's to not what? going to be free. <laughs> you, you mentioned in your testimony earlier about the open, open network architecture concept that's either coming or already in place, soon to be implemented. Could you expand on what that is uh, and, and why it's coming into place? Yes, sir. Um, Open network architecture is a concept developed by the Federal Communications Commission that allows a group of vendors called enhanced service providers to access the public telephone network and gain through the public telephone network access to the customers attached to that network. So this would not be anyone with his home PC to be able to access the uh, If he was an enhanced service provider, yes, it would be someone with his home PC because the key part of open network architecture is that the software that the telephone company uses to create its services must be made available to the enhanced service providers. And the enhanced service providers then uh, create their own services 
just like the telephone company does. They create their own services and offer those services. So they need access to the software that is this critical millions of lines of code, a few lines in error, causes the system to crash. And, and this is what makes me nervous. <laughs> how, do, how does one become an enhanced service provider? Uh, by, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that's established yet. I think uh, I could become one tomorrow if I wanted to, if ONA was in place. I could say, look, I, I want to be an enhanced service provider, and the telephone company would would, would uh, be forced to uh, allow me to be one, and I would ap have access then to the software in the central office switch. So to the best of your knowledge, there's no regulation of what that would be, how one would qualify uh, any agency that would oversee whether or not one is in fact an enhanced service provider? I don't know the answer to that. I, uh, I, I, don't, I just don't know. You should ask the FCC that question. Okay. You, you uh, described external forces at work here that have place the industry in a position where it has moved maybe faster than it would have without those pressures. Could you identify for me what those forces are and, and how they're in fact uh, affecting the industry in that way? Well, uh, yes sir. Uh, I've mentioned ONA, uh, uh, certainly, and I've also mentioned some, some time schedules that turned out to be unrealistic or caused vulnerability. Uh, because of the implementation, the Hinsdale uh, fire uh, implication I've already mentioned. Uh, the FCC recently uh, has, has uh, ruled that there could be network interconnection by alternate line carriers, the ALTs, uh, and, and uh, has ruled that, that uh, others that supply local service have to be able to connect into uh, the, the, the current telephone network. Now I feel if this is not done considering network vulnerability, that it could very well be done in a way which would cause more and new crashes of the network. I think another area that has impacted uh, 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 the ability of the network to proceed properly is the, is the modified final judgment. The Bell Operating Companies are not allowed to, to help in this software problem that has recently occurred because they're constrained uh, through information to not being in the information services business. They can't help in terms of, of, of examining the software today and, and, and helping the vendors resolve this current problem. They've got to go to Judge antitrust? Green. I'm sorry, is that because of antitrust obstacles? It's be no, it's because of the modified final judgment. They've got to go to Judge Green and ask his permission to help solve this problem today. I think that's crazy. So, so th those are, are four examples of where regulatory uh, uh, intervention is, is causing the network not to be as, as reliable as it should be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. I, I wonder if, if your testimony can be put a little bit closer to perspective to the most recent outages we've had, such as in the Washington, D.C. area. And here's what I'm trying to figure out. Did we have these failures because of either some f failure of equipment or design initially which should not have occurred, or are failures to be expected no matter what kind of equipment and design you have and there was an inadequate backup system, or both? Sir, I, in my opinion, it's inadequate backup systems. I don't believe that signaling system number seven, which is the system that failed most recently, can ever be designed so that it never uh, has an outage. I think that's impossible. Uh, and, I, and I feel again, uh, as Mr. Bryan pointed out, that, that uh, there have been other failures. AT&T's network w uh, went down in January 1990, same basic cause. SS, the, the common channel signaling idea is fundamentally flawed in the sense that it can fail and take a whole network down. It needs a backup. So, and, and we're not here to point fingers, but to get at what the, what the major difficulties might be. But if we were to point fingers, we would not be pointing it at the initial system. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you just said it cannot be designed to be flawless. Yes, yes and sir. And therefore, we have to expect uh, an outage, and then the question is, what happens after that? Yes, sir. And that's where we are presently inadequate in having not a sufficient backup system uh, in place right now. Yes, sir. Now, the, the reason 
why you say that this phenomenon can happen now and did happen obviously but couldn't happen 10 years ago that's because more traffic is going through certain central points now is that what is changing the, the scene here that's correct the traffic has been centralized now rather than fully distributed and if the central points fail then the network goes down and well, and and that's exactly right was there a in the previous system which was less centralized there was an adequate backup system at that time so that if something went down along the system something could take over for it and we wouldn't have this kind of massive outage yes sir there were many multi-frequency senders and many multi-frequency receivers at each node in the hierarchy that mr mccandless described as a scientist uh, do you think it will be particularly difficult to devise an adequate backup system? I know that's, that's asking how high is up, I suppose, but as you see things uh, from a scientific manner, as you suggest we address this, does that appear that it's going to be easy to solve or very difficult to solve? Can you make any estimate? I, th I think it's easy to solve. Let me give you an example. We just recently put in this signaling system, number seven system, and, and the old system was in place, and it worked quite well until we put in signaling system number seven. Well, why didn't we design the network to use the equipment already in place if the signaling system number seven failed? It's the, it was there. Now, I don't know what's happened to it. It was probably taken out and scrapped. But why wasn't it left as an ultimate backup? Well, can, can you offer an answer to that question? I, no, I can't. I, I, haven't, I don't know why it wasn't done that way. I th well, I can, I can speculate. I can speculate because the people who designed signaling system number seven didn't think it could ever fail. They did not agree with the material that was in our report. Thank you very much, Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Schiff. On the question, uh, following up on some of the questions Mr. Schiff was talking about, indeed every member, on redundancy. So as I understand your testimony then, what some would consider a backup, which is uh, not one, but two STPs, not physically connected to each other, and on e each STP are two computers. Your testimony is that that's not sufficient backup, and that's not true redundancy. Is that yes, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, there should be two different technologies. I'll give you an example. Uh, AT&T was lucky in January 1990 because they were moving from what's called common channel signaling system number uh, six to common channel signaling system number seven. When AT&T failed in January 1990, their signaling system number seven was completely off the air. And fortunately, they had not taken signaling system number six out yet. All of the traffic carried by AT&T, which was only half of what was left, was carried by the older system. So that there are ways of, of, of employing independency, and it has to be independency, uh, that would cause uh, networks not to crash. And are we, as I understand the system that is on operation today in which you have a, sing, uh, a separate uh, signaling channel uh, from the, the voice channel, and you send a, what I call the scout out to find the route, and uh, then reports back, and then you move the communication along that route. But as I understand what's being done today is, is a, a patchwork effort, is an effect to eliminate the problem that's causing the outages. The companies have knocked out the signaling channel. And so, in effect, we're back to the old technology in some ways, aren't we? I wish the old technology had been there uh, because what was left was nothing. I mean, once the scout, as you pointed out, was, was, uh, was shot, uh, there was nothing left to send uh, a message as to how to set up a call or take down a call. And, and so the network uh, stopped working. You have made in your testimony a case for adapting a set of network reliability standards and working them into the present framework. Is this something that, in your opinion, the telephone industry could, could ado adopt? Could they easily adapt to this? Yes, sir. I, 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 I gave a speech in Denver, Colorado, two weeks ago, proposing this concept for the first time. And as Mr. Bryant pointed out, I, I fully support his idea of network quality standards uh, and measurements uh, on those standards. And if, what I believe will be a final question is both from the recommendations of your report or perhaps in some subsequent thoughts you may have had, what role do you see the FCC is playing in all of this? Uh, I think the FCC should play an oversight role. 
I made my proposal for the Yule and a national standard of three Yules uh, uh, for quality to the Exchange Carrier Standards Association. I feel that that association is, since it's fully accredited by the American National Standards Institute, is qualified to set national standards and I believe the FCC should review the work and say yes it's adequate or no it's inadequate but I believe the industry should be left alone to set these types of standards. And what type of enforcement would you foresee? I think if the FCC is unhappy with what they see, he's, they see the industry doing that they, they should uh, 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 take whatever action that, that they are chartered by the Congress to take. Well, I want to uh, uh, thank you, Mr. McDonald. I want to be the first, though. I'm not sure, quite frankly, the Yule um, designation may be a bit tough to sell, uh, <laughs> particularly because I can see you requiring people to keep Yule logs. The, um, what I would suggest, <laughs> it's a slow group, I can tell. Um, uh, but what I would suggest, and let me be the first to christen your scale if it's ever adopted, uh, and I think it has a lot of merit, is the McDonald scale, <laughs> and uh, uh, we'll see, uh, see how, that, uh, how that flies. Um, Mr. McCandless, do you have any oh, follow-up questions? Chairman. Mr. Cox? We want to thank you very much for your participation in this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next appearing will be Richard Firestone, Chief of the Common Carrier Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission and Howard C. Davenport, General Counsel, the District of Columbia Public Service Commission, and I believe Mr. Davenport will be, a, be accompanied. Anyone who is likely to be testifying, if you would stand and raise your right hands, please. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you very much. Mr. Firestone, your uh, written statement in its entirety has already made a part of the record, so I'd invite you to summarize in any way you see fit, uh, and then uh, I'll turn to Mr. Davenport for, with the same request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, in addition to uh, my brief opening statement, I'd like to submit for the record a document that was published by the FCC last night, uh, which was a summary of the FCC's proceedings uh, regarding telephone service and it was a summary of the closed meeting of the Federal Communications Commission yesterday dealing with the subject of these network outages and I'd like to submit that for the record as Without well. Without objection right. that will be entered into the record. I'd like to briefly summarize for you today the actions that have been taken by the Federal Communications Commission concerning the recent major disruptions to telephone service in some sections of the country. As you know, network disruptions associated with the sophisticated signaling systems that route and control calls occurred in two Bell Operating Company regions between June 26th and July 3rd of this year. The Commission was in constant contact with the companies involved and other industry members throughout that period, as well as working with other agencies and entities with responsibilities in this area and with the other witnesses coming today have been in contact also with the involved state commissions. On that first day, FCC Chairman Alfred Sykes expressed the Commission's concern any time there is a significant disruption in telephone service. He expressed our view this way. Americans are entitled to the best possible phone service, and this agency is committed to doing everything it can to make sure high quality service is provided. In launching an investigation on June 26th, the chairman added that we will, working with the companies, find out the cause of this problem. If actions by the FCC can prevent or minimize its recurrence, we will not hesitate to act. Now, the FCC also intends to keep these recent disruptions in their proper perspe perspective. Disruptions of telephone service are not a new or unique phenomena, especially in an era when companies are meeting growing customer, customer demands for new technology, such as high-capacity fiber optic facilities and sophisticated computer-controlled switching systems. However, the FCC has and will continue to monitor telephone company practices to assure the public that carriers fulfill their responsibilities to provide the kind of high quality, reliable communication service that the public expects and deserves. As I've indicated, the FCC investigation is ongoing, and therefore I cannot publicly go into great detail at this point concerning particular aspects of our inquiry. Let me make a few fundamental points, however. First, there is no evidence that the nation's telecommunications networks are degrading. In fact, the recent major network service outages have involved the inadvertent side effects of efforts by the companies to upgrade both their long distance and local networks, respectively. In addition, 
The FCC has recently put in place a thorough and stringent monitoring system to measure the quality of our network of networks. And we will be vigilant in reviewing and acting upon the information we receive. All of us want to preserve network quality in this country. Second, it is a fact that the increased capacity of modern fiber optic trunks magnifies the impact, for example, of a cable being mistakenly cut. On the one hand, the increased use of computer-controlled digital switches has provided new capabilities and services, such as backup systems and automatic rerouting of traffic. On the other, increased interconnection, which is indispensable in today's nationwide, indeed worldwide, telecommunications environment, also increases the risk that isolated problems can spread quickly. Third, the dependence upon fiber optics, digital switching, out-of-band signaling, and a diverse array of manufacturers and suppliers is an irreversible trend. Such investments in a modern network are taking place because the public demands it. The clock cannot be turned back. Any attempt to do so would result in a disastrous downturn in our international competitiveness. Yet we do have to recognize and address the problems that accompany transition to new technologies and industry structures. In response to previous major disruptions in telephone service, a January 1990 software-related problem and a January 1991 fiber optic cable cut impacting the AT&T long distance network, the FCC issued detailed investigative reports focusing particularly on the implications of these events for our nation's communications policies. Similarly, an FCC investigation of the recent disruptions in local telephone company service has been underway since the day of the Bell Atlantic and Pacific Telesis network outages. Yesterday, the Commission met in closed session to review the results of our investigation to date. Subsequently, we announced that we will be taking four additional steps in the near future to ensure carriers meet their responsibilities to provide reliable, high-quality communication service to the public. First, the FCC will summon senior representatives of the long distance and local telephone companies, equipment manufacturers, software providers, standard setting organizations, and communications users to a meeting in Washington. Our goal for this industry-wide assemblage is to address the possible risks faced by contemporary and future networks, the potential impact of network interconnection, the effectiveness of current communications and coordinating measures, including standard setting and testing bodies, and what mechanisms are available and should be used with respect to network coordination and service integrity issues. Second, the Commission staff will simultaneously be researching how comparable industries, transportation, electric power, for example, both here and abroad, have put in place mechanisms or processes that effectively reduce or minimize the impact of service disruptions. We want structures that work, not theoretical frameworks. Third, the FCC will take steps to increase its staff directed to network reliability issues, including assigning staff to work more closely with the National Coordinating Center, where we already have a liaison relationship. This intergovernmental and inter-industry body focuses on network reliability from a national security and emergency preparedness perspective. And then fourth, the Commission will strengthen requirements upon local and long-distance companies to notify the FCC promptly of any future network disruptions. High-quality, reliable telecommunications service has been a touchstone of our nation, and it is more important today than ever before. It is the industry's job to provide it, and ours to hold the industry accountable for providing it. We believe the steps we've announced are consistent with that structure, and this Commission is committed to following through. And with that, I'd be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Firestone. Uh, Mr. Davenport? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Howard Davenport, currently General Counsel of the Public Service Commission of the District of Columbia. I've been nominated by Mayor Sharon Pratt Dixon to, to become the D.C. Commission's Chairman. I've been confirmed by the D.C. Council. I'm due to be sworn in as Chairman of the D.C. Commission no later than Friday. July 19th. I just want to make sure we're not keeping you from the swearing in. Uh, <laughs> if you got that close, let's go for it. Yes. Okay. I'm pleased to appear before this subcommittee today to explain what the D.C. Commission is doing to ensure that citizens of the District of Columbia receive adequate local telephone service. The D.C. Commission has the power, after a hearing, 
to direct that reasonable repairs, improvements, changes, or additions to service or equipment be made by CMP within a reasonable time. In addition, the D.C. Commission may oversee new technology when it is introduced in the context of a new rate filing. The D.C. Commission may refuse to allow the ratepayers to pay for new construction. It may require that new technology costs be allocated in accordance with public benefits. This last power may be most effective since it increases the cost of the utility if the service is not adequate. With respect to the adequacy of telephone service, the D.C. Commission has taken a number of steps. We have established a digital deployment reporting group to discuss CMP's planned deployment of digital facilities on a regular basis and to develop a digital deployment reporting system. Second, we have reviewed CMP's plans for deploying equipment. Third, the D.C. Commission has before it the issues of, one, the reasonableness and prudency of CMP's construction program, and two, the costs and benefits of digital switches, fiber optics, SS7, and other new technologies. The D.C. Commission is very concerned with the recent allergies. While up to this time telephone service has been adequate, the recent events warrant investigation to make sure that they do not reoccur. At this time, the D.C. Commission staff is conducting its investigation in an informal manner and is in contact with CMP, the FCC, and other state commissions. Should the informal investigation warrant a hearing or action in a rate case, the D.C. Commission will take such action. At this time, the D.C. Commission has only partial information as to the reason for the outages. Based on the information we have from CMP, it appears that there was not a capacity problem that led to the overload of maintenance messages which resulted in the outage. The SS7 signaling system has been designed to carry the signaling required by the long distance calls to or from the District of Columbia as well as signaling requirements of new digital services. Neither the long distance signaling load nor the load for these new services is currently carried by the SS7 network, so the system is currently lightly loaded. Therefore, the problem appears to be related to the SS7 software provided by DSC Corporation. Belcor issues the specifications for signal transfer point switches in the SS7 software and test the delivered hardware and software for regional companies. Bell Atlantic does not have an independent capability to fully test SS7 equipment provided by DSC, but rather relies on Belcor. It is yet unclear whether the problem is with Belcor specifications and testing or with the equipment and software provided to meet those specifications by DSC. Based on recent reports, it appears that the problem is with DSC software. I am pleased to say that Belcor and Bell Atlantic have established working groups to address problems, and this hopefully will result in improved performance of the system. For the present, Bell Atlantic is making temporary fixes, such as monitoring and blocking the maintenance messages which overload the SS7 network. It is also working to identify and make corrections to the existing software and considering the addition of backup facilities to eliminate signaling system outages in the future. And I particularly want to commend Mr. McDonald, who suggested that we may need to go to backup systems. However, there is some consideration which must be given to how much it would cost. A cost-benefit analysis would be appropriate before adopting fully backup systems. However, the underlying reasons for the outage, particularly why there was not sufficient testing of the software and its long-term solution have not been determined. In our investigation, there are a number of matters to consider. For example, it may be necessary to investigate how Bell Atlantic gives the proper personnel adequate guidance to take the necessary steps to isolate and cut off a problem before it spreads. It may further be necessary to investigate whether the use of existing network architecture along with new technology may exacerbate the problem and cause it to spread. Certainly with the development of software which has enables telephone companies to provide beneficial services, telecommunication systems have become far more complex and difficult to test than before. In any event, the D.C. Commission, in conjunction with other commissions, will follow through to make sure that CMP maintains its reliability. We have asked CNT, CNP to provide us with copies of its deployment plans for SS7 and asked to participate in its planning for network emergencies. 
With this information, the D.C. Commission will be able to take whatever actions are necessary to assure the CMP meets its responsibility to provide safe and adequate service to the public. Uh, this concludes my statement. I will be happy to answer any questions that the, that the subcommittee may have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davenport. Um, in dealing with the first turning to the Federal Communications Commission and its role, which I think is an uh, important part of this hearing and certainly of this subcommittee's uh, jurisdiction. Um, Mr. Firestone, you spoke about a number of failures to the nation's phone network, uh, and that's, of course, been the subject of today's hearing. Not only the outages of the past few weeks, but you also referred to those that AT&T experienced last year. Did the FCC have any advance warning of these type of outages? Uh, if you or that they would be likely to occur? Okay. If you mean, was there uh, knowledge in the community that there uh, was the possibility of outages? Yes, that has been known and, in fact, has occurred uh, over past years. What we have seen of particular significance in recent time is the magnified impact of outages. There have always been cable cuts. There have always been switches that burn out and go down. What we have seen with the development of modern technology high capacity services and the increasing dependence on more and more businesses on our telecommunications network is that the impact of those outages has increased. The harm caused, if you will, by those outages uh, has increased over time. But yes, outages have always taken place and we are aware of that, as has the industry. And that's why I tried to emphasize in uh, uh, my brief opening remarks that what we looked at very carefully was whether the communications carriers were letting their, ne their networks degrade or what was the cause of these outages. And in both the, of the AT&T cases that I referenced and in this most recent rash of cases, what we had were, was uh, very significant investments in upgrading the networks, in installing the uh, latest technology and in increasing the capacity and capabilities of the networks. Something obviously went awry in that implementation. There's no question about that. Uh, but from a communications policy perspective, what we thought was critical was that the companies were not in the midst of allowing their maintenance or their, their networks to degrade, but rather were, were in the process of upgrading their networks and doing what they could to provide additional capabilities. And one other point, because I, I heard a reference uh, briefly as I, as I came in earlier uh, to the question of whether there were backups uh, and, and uh, whether backup systems exist in Signaling System 7. In fact, what appears to be the case, and again, this is very preliminary in our, in, in our investigation, and I think as you'll hear from some of the companies later today, uh, very preliminary still in their investigation, but the Signaling System 7 architecture that was being installed is premised on very significant redundancy and backups being built into the system. Uh, the mated pairs, if you will, of computers in geographically diverse locations, two in the Baltimore area, but in two different parts of, ba of the Baltimore area, for example, and then backup for them in the Washington area by two other geographically diverse locations. Okay? What has happened in this most recent rash of incidents is that a problem in one of those locations, rather than the other locations providing backup for the inevitable situation where a circuit board burns out or something else goes wrong in a piece of hardware, what happened was the problem spread through these backup systems rather than being isolated, and so the redundancy actually became a vehicle to spread the problem rather than, than a backup to it. So again, it wasn't a lack of planned redundancy or backup. It was a, f uh, a flaw, apparently, at this point, and this is all very preliminary, a flaw in implementation of that. And obviously, we're going to be looking very carefully, as will all the companies involved, in uh, how that came about and what can be done about that. It can, there's a very fair argument about whether or not backup is worth the cost, the cost-benefit uh, analysis that Mr. Davenport referred to and Mr. McDonald referred to. But I guess I have to question, if I've got a car that's made by Company X that doesn't work very well, that didn't work, isn't working, and I jump into another car made by Company X that breaks down in the same manner because they all, ha they all have the same problem, then that's not backup. If I'm relying upon the same system that just broke down, even though I've got two of them, it just seems to me I've multiplied my problems, I've doubled my problems. You have 
as I understand the system you have, in the SSS system you have two uh, STP facilities not connected physically with one another. Each one has two computers. But if there is a problem in the very nature of that system, then you can have all of them stacked up on top of one another and you still don't have backup. Isn't that correct? And that, I think, was illustrated by what happened here. If, there, if there's backup, why did six million people lose their service for up to seven hours? Well, first, I, I think you, you should direct some of those questions to some of the engineers who I think will be appearing before you later. But let me, let me give you my uh, uh, assessment based on talking both to our staff in this preliminary point of our investigation and in, t in uh, working with the companies and with other industry experts and government people involved because there are another, a, a number of, of government agencies who have had an interest in parts of this. Uh, and that is the, the notion of redundancy and backups is vital to any modern communication system. Uh, the idea that somehow uh, these could all be isolated from each other, uh, equipment from uh, different manufacturers using different protocols or different software, uh, using different total technology, uh, ignores the fact that we have not only local, but nationwide and worldwide communications needs that the very customers you're referring to have the need to communicate either with their business outlets, their customers, their suppliers, or as individuals with family members and others all across the country and around the world. These systems are of necessity interconnected. These systems are of necessity using common protocols, common language, if you will, by which to communicate with each other. Otherwise, long distance and, and uh, international calls, as well as local calls, could not be set up and handed off across the, the networks. At the same time, built into the structure, the architecture of those networks are supposed to be backup systems, if you will, fail-safe devices. And it is, in fact, apparently one set of those fail-safe kind of devices, the error messages that were generated by a switch that was having trouble that spread through the system. Again, uh, is there a problem? Yes, clearly there was a problem. Uh, is the solution uh, a totally uh, isolated, insulated, uh, separate system of communications networks, uh, both in terms of cost and in terms of practical operation of the network, I think that's probably an impossible solution. Uh, if I can, it might be helpful to refer to, because I think you raised the question of, uh, how, uh, as did Mr. Davenport, a cost-benefit analysis and what would customers be willing to pay. Uh, after the NRC report, I believe that it was that uh, Mr. McDonald made reference to, uh, the Office of Technology Assessment, for example, uh, did a, a study and referenced those NRC reports and predictions, projections, if you will, within them. They started off the report by saying, security and survivability are essential characteristics of the communications infrastructure. However, establishing a secure and survivable infrastructure requires trade-offs between security and survivability on the one hand and access, cost, and ease of use on the other. And then they cited uh, a recent survey of users at where only 17% of the Fortune 1000 sites were protected by encryption or callback type security systems. One major reason cited for the failure to use such systems was cost. Thus, many business, and I'm quoting from the OTA report, thus many businessmen are likely to be opposed to the government setting security survivability standards or preparedness requirements on the grounds that such action would constitute undue interference in the affairs of the private sector. And they may be particularly reluctant, this report goes on to say, to invest in communication security because its value has to be traded off not only against cost, but also against system access and interoperability. In the New York cable cut uh, that disrupted service in January of 1991, we found some customers, uh, one of the stock exchanges, for example, continued to operate. It had acquired backup capacity and facilities, whereas another exchange shut down because it had chosen not to acquire that kind of backup. Some hospitals have uh, backup diesel generators should their electric power fail. Depending on the kinds of needs and uh, uh, requirements of the companies involved, there will have to be choices made as to what kinds of costs they're willing to incur. And in particular, with respect to the public switch network, what kind of cost society as a whole, individual consumers where we're worried about uh, uh, universal service and their access to the system, are they willing to pay costs of how much reliability, redundancy, backup in the system? The notion of a totally separate duplicate network uh, is not a simple answer 
uh, though we have taken a number of steps to increase the entry of competition, both in the long distance market and now we've begun a proceeding to increase competition in the local marketplace uh, with the idea being customers will have choices. There will be multiple vendors of service out there and that will give them the ability to make those kinds of selections in terms of security and reliability. That's a mouthful. Uh, so let's try and take it uh, piece by piece. First of all, I think that gets to a central issue that's before the subcommittee is whether or not the FCC sh uh, should have been involved in setting some kind of standards and whether the FCC should have been more responsive to the NRC report. In response, I'd say, I live in Clendenin, West Virginia. I live in a rural area. I can't afford the backup, defensive backup system that I think I hear you suggesting that I should be buying if I want to be secure. I'm supposed to buy a backup system, apparently, if I want to call 911, if I want to make sure I can call the Clendenin Police Department, if I want to make sure that I can call my office. What about the uh, stockbroker in Charleston, West Virginia, who during the seven-hour outage lost $25,000, he estimates, of uh, uh, commercial business? And so the list goes on and on. And my concern is that in this kind of uh, analysis that you're doing, uh, that, that we're ignoring that. I don't think anybody that answered that survey that you're, you're citing uh, anticipated an outage affecting six million people at a time. And so those, those questions, I think, are very, very important. The question I have, though, is in your response to that, it indicates that the FCC, of course, is aware of this report. Uh, did you make any reaction, have any reaction to it when it was published, or did you, were you involved in uh, uh, formulating any kind of response? Uh, no, first, I have to say I was not at the FCC at that point, but uh, that was, was before my tenure. But in addition, uh, that report, as I understand it, went to uh, some of the national security involved intergovernmental bodies, uh, and I hate to start throwing out acronyms, but there's NSTAC and a number of other uh, national security related uh, bodies, and they were involved on an intergovernmental and then also inter-industry basis in evaluating uh, these kinds of reports, and as I noted, both the, uh, as was the Office of Technology Assessment in reviewing uh, in the chapter I was citing here, it's titled Security and Survivability of the Communications Infrastructure. So this has been an ongoing intergovernmental process for some time, again, trading off needs for security and reliability costs. And the, the trade-offs are not merely someone going out and buying uh, their own separate system. Uh, that is true for some of the largest customers, yes. That is one technique that has been used. The question is, how much cost will be imposed on every consumer of telephone service to achieve what, re levels, of what levels of reliability? Uh, because everyone who uses the telephone will pay for increased levels of redundancy and reliability. There, the uh, Office of Technology Assessment report, in fact, quoted one telephone company manager saying, there's nothing we can't do. There are only things you can't afford. Uh, and I, I don't want to endorse the simplistic nature of that kind of a quote taken out of context, but there is that trade-off that will have to be made and is always being made. But from our perspective, we have to ensure that the carriers exercise their responsibility to provide reliable telephone service to the public. I guess my reaction is um, that the report predicted what would happen. And my concern is that we're going in different, you and I are going in different directions. We're not going to resolve that today. But my concern is we're going in different directions because you're saying in your statement that there is no, uh, the FCC believes there's virtually no evidence indicating an adverse change in the reliability of the present telecommunication system. There's no evidence to indicate deterioration in network performance. This report suggests that while we are improving our telecommunications performance, at the same time there are greater vulnerabilities and that there's a need to deal with that. My, my, quest, and my concern is that the FCC in the past has not accepted that, that indeed it's taken the position that you are taking right now, which is if you want protection, go buy it. If I want protection in Clendenin, go hire a Pinkerton. Uh, and so that's my, that's my concern. But let's get to what the FCC was doing beforehand. And may I ask you, in the recommendations that were made in the closed meeting yesterday, and I'm delighted we were able to get these in time for this hearing, uh, in the recommendations made in the closed meeting yesterday, could I read in those recommendations that at least there's some uh, some adherence to some of the recommendations that were made in this report. It does seem to me that the FCC is taking a greater role today than it was yesterday and than it was last month in looking at overall, overall network reliability. 
Let me uh, back up, if I can, to some of the previous incidents and then some of what we have been learning during the course of this set of incidents. Uh, in the previous incidents, uh, the two most pronounced get, that obviously got the most attention involved AT&T. Uh, and we uh, spent a great deal of time and effort in investigating, reviewing what took place in those networks, the implications of it for the policies that had been put in place, and whether, again, they were signs of, of attempts to improve the network and flaws in that or, or degradation. In the most recent case, what we have seen is a problem that exists beyond uh, what was described beforehand, and that is uh, inadequate communication among different levels of the industry, that uh, different local exchange carriers, local telephone companies who experience problems are not necessarily communicating that with their brethren in other parts of the country, that in long distance carriers who experience problems in these interconnected networks using some of the same kinds of equipment and software are not adequately communicating through existing standards bodies and others the nature of those problems. And so that is ind indeed one of the steps that, the, that we uh, discussed yesterday and that the Commission is moving forward on based on what we have seen preliminarily out of this set of incidents is that more communication among levels of the industry and with FCC oversight, more activity within existing standards and testing in other bodies would in fact help uh, spread not merely problems through the network, the discussion that we've had earlier, but also potential solutions and recognition of those problems. And so, yes, we are taking uh, uh, a more aggressive step now based on what we have seen coming out of uh, the lack of adequate communication uh, leading up to these, these uh, most recent events. Thank you. I've uh, been overly generous with my time to myself, and so I turn to Mr. McCandless. I was going to wonder about the backup clock and the planned <laughs> inning. At a slow pace down there in West Virginia. Uh, Mr. Firestone, in a brief answer, I only have five minutes. I'm not the chairman. <laughs> Sure. But you get another round, too. I'd like your thoughts to the committee on what the responsibility of the FCC is, and particularly your uh, responsibility as Chief of the Common Carrier Bureau, which deals directly with the subject in question. What is your responsibility under the laws that you act? Quick, quickly. Our now, responsibility is to out. provide oversight to ensure that carriers fulfill their public responsibilities to provide reliable, efficient and low-cost service to the public. Our responsibility is not to design the networks or write the software that goes into the networks. That's obviously beyond the capability or authority or responsibility of the FCC. Okay. In providing that oversight and uh, that responsibility, are you a bureau that is to act or react? Uh, I think it is fair to say both, and that is directed give me an example, at... Give me an example of act I, I rather will do than that. react. I will do that. In response to the incidents that have taken place, the AT&T cable cut and this incident, we are in fact investigating, looking at the causes of those kinds of problems. Which is a reaction. That is reactive. Reaction. Being proactive suggests taking a number of steps directed at uh, ensuring that the infrastructure of this country is being built up that there will be adequate facilities, that the companies have incentives. How do you, how do you perform that service? Well, let me give you two examples. One, uh, we have moved to a system of incentive-based regulation or price cap regulation, which provides through, the through, companies. You do this through regulation? Yes. And that's, that's as a result of a public hearing? I'm sorry? How do, you, how do you arrive at the regulations that will pose an action uh, These are a result of public proceedings with comment, reply comments, uh, and, and uh, public commission meetings, both with respect to the price cap or incentive regulation I talked about okay. and the advent of new competition. Mr. Mr. McDonald was not sure exactly how the timeline in his presentation uh, ultimately took place that required certain things to happen within a certain period of time. Uh, can you share with us how that timeline happened? Was it administratively or judicial? Providing that a requirement that certain uh, capabilities for uh, these various and sundry uh, uh, users or providers, that that equipment be available and online by a certain period of time. Well, 
Were you here SF, when he gave the testimony? I did not hear his testimony. I just you understand heard the my end question? of the questions. You I think I understand the, the significance of your question. I think, I, I I think what he's talking about is, as a result of deregulation, there was a requirement that, uh, that the companies provide a certain level of, uh, of capability for those who wish to enter the market. Yes. And that there was a timeline to bring this uh, on, online, and that in his testimony he said one of the problems that we have had is that that timeline has forced the issue at the expense of quality. If I yes. understood Mr. McDonald right, he's shaking his head affirmative, so I must have quoted him reasonably accurately. Okay. Uh, there, there are two parts of that response. One, yes, the, the uh, breakup of the uh, AT&T system yes. in 1984 how was the did time, How was the timeline established? Who, who established the timeline? Well, the breakup of AT&T came about as a result of an antitrust action brought by the federal government and then implemented by the U.S. District Court. Uh, which broke up the, vest the divestiture, as it's referred to, of AT&T and separated the long distance from local networks and required something called equal access. That is, allowing other long distance carriers we, to have We understand access. all that, Mr. Firestone. Equal access timeline was provided by whom? Uh, initially established through the U.S. District Court and then implemented as well by the FCC. Give me the date at which the, the court acted on the on the various uh, uh, breaking up of the system. What, what date was that? Uh, it took place between 1982 when the decree was signed in 1984 when it was implemented. All right. Um, in, in Mr. McDonald's testimony, he talked about the fact that, that the court must be consulted because it would be illegal without that consent for AT&T to work with the, uh, the company in question to collectively solve a problem. Now, this was 1991. Do we still have, to that degree, this court acting as an, quote, administrator, unquote, in such items as I have outlined? Uh, the court is very much actively involved in that kind of, of role. In fact, at 10 o'clock this morning, as I understand it, there is a hearing before Judge Green at which Bell Atlantic is appearing to seek a waiver of the decree to allow it to work right. on the production right. of right. software right. for yeah. this. Yeah. So, yes. Now, we're looking at something like nine years since the basic decision? That's correct. Right. It's, uh, at, what, at what point does the court get out of the business of managing telephone companies? Well, we at the FCC have maintained for a number of years that that role should be taken away from the court and transferred to the expert agencies that were established for that purpose. There is legislation pending before the Congress now that would move in that direction, but how it has not is, yet been acted How long has this legislation been pending? Uh, there have been discussions and hearings for uh, a number of years, actually, well, about it. But it. Give me an idea of the, what you mean by a number of years. Uh, in the last section of the Congress, there were a series of hearings, bills introduced, uh, there is a bill that is actually now passed the Senate uh, that would allow the companies into manufacturing, for example, uh, which includes the production of software. Does this bill address the basic issue that I outlined to you, the problem of the fact that the court has to hear something before you can get people to solve a problem? It would in certain areas, in this case manufacturing, remove the role of the court substantially from that. That's correct. It would leave the role of the court in place for some other features like whether the local companies can get into long distance service. What is your assessment as the, uh, as the member of FCC for it that has the basic responsibility here? Uh, isn't it time we got the court out of this and put the FCC back in some kind of a regulatory role? Uh, that has been the FCC's position and one we, we have firmly supported uh, and uh, continue to support. Now, wouldn't that be an action that the FCC should be working diligently on? We cannot take that action without congressional... Uh, uh, I understand that. I understand that. Have you, uh, as a uh, department, uh, proposed this action? Yes, we have. We have been up re testifying repeatedly before both the House and Senate encouraging that kind of action and working with the administration in that regard as well. Um, we have here a series of outages going back to 1989 of some magnitude that brought the attention of the public to a problem 
and uh, through 1990 and now 1991. Um, at what point, in your opinion, should action have been taken rather than now you're reacting? And I refer now to on July 9th, we have a summary of Commission's proceedings regarding telephone service in which they're proposing uh, a specific number of uh, steps be taken. And, and to me, uh, and, and I would like your reaction, this is kind of like closing the barn door after the horse is gone. Well, I think it's important to note that those are additional steps we're now proposing to take in addition to the kinds of things that have been in place and operating previously. For example, uh, last year, the Commission established service quality monitoring reporting by all the local exchange companies uh, to ensure that we could track the degree of such things as switch downtime, trunk blockage, customer satisfaction, numbers of customer complaints, and have all of that information reported systematically to us so that we could see over time whether there were, was any degradation in the network. Okay. Uh, in addition, as I indicated, there have been a number of steps to both increase the advent of competition in the long distance network and now steps that were taken earlier this year by the FCC to increase the uh, uh, development of competition in the local network so there will be alternative choices for customers. There will be other networks. So a problem in one network will not necessarily eliminate choices that customers can make. Uh, you said in your earlier comment that it is the responsibility in, in the action category for the FCC to look to the future and the need to, the, to maintain the level of services that the United States public is entitled to, if I understood you correctly. Yes. In so performing that function, do you get involved at all in the general concept of how that's to be carried out as far as the uh, engineering is concerned, which is currently a part of this hearing as to whether you should do it this way or that way in, in terms of the general approach rather than we're going to use this widget instead of that widget. Yes, very mu it, it, it is very much beyond our capability uh, from an engineering perspective or otherwise to design pieces of equipment or select no, individual I, I pieces. Know. But yes, we are very much involved in overseeing the, the standards process, both internationally and domestically. All right, does, does uh, one of the phone companies come to you and say, you have talked to us about expanding services because of what you consider to be a need as a public agency? We are, we are stepping up to that requirement. Uh, there are three ways that we can do this. We can use this system with lines here and there, with a box here that says there's a building and then we can do this over here. Or we can do this system. Going back again to Mr. McDonald's uh, comments relative to there are various ways by which uh, you route or, or provide the service, but then you become technical in the process of doing that. Uh, is, do you perform any function like that, the FCC? No. What we do is ensure that carriers meet their responsibility. They have to design their network. How, how do you the ensure they meet their responsibility? Uh, we review first their investment plans, uh, the depreciation rates and such that go into uh, their, the, uh, uh, their determination of the rates they get to charge. Uh, we review the uh, activities of standards bodies, and we set some of the basic ground rules, if you will, for the uh, operations of the network. Uh, but in addition, uh, and I think it's important to emphasize, we have uh, reached the conclusion over time that one of the greatest uh, spurs to reliability in existing networks and providing reliability options to customers is to provide more competitive opportunities. Competition, uh, if you will, frightens existing companies into performing better and being more responsive to customers as well as providing customers with alternative choices. And so some of the steps to bring new carriers into the marketplace uh, also will have that same kind of beneficial impact. When, a, when we have an airplane uh accident. We have an immediate response on the part of a, of a federal agency. They investigate, arrive ultimately at what they consider the reason for the failure. And in most cases, lives are lost and so on and so forth. 
Using that as a comparison, uh, we have had a number of major failures which may or may not have had lives involved, but certainly had a great deal else in the way of activity beyond that of just inconvenience. Is it your perception that the FCC should act as the National Safety Board, go to the scene to investigate, to arrive at some conclusions, and then those conclusions would be implemented by the system in order to help prevent that from happening again? Well, I don't want to suggest that we have the capabilities to have uh, uh, the size of response in, involved in those cases. But yes, no, in I'm, each I'm of the talking, cases I'm talking we here have about, done that. I'm talking here about major, right. the ones I mean, that we those, have been talking about here in the Washington area. Right. This, it, is, this is a 747 that crashed. It I wasn't a little and in each of those cases Cessna we have, 173. In each of those cases, the two uh, AT&T outages that were discussed and the one underway right now, our investigation underway right now, we have in fact had a team working on that, talking to the involved companies, talking to other members of the industry, manufacturers and other experts, working with the national security and emergency preparedness community in the government, and, uh, in, in fact, uh, the head of our domestic facilities, for, for example, in the cable cut situation, uh, was actually uh, going down in the manhole in the street in Newark where the cable was cut, uh, looking at the cables and the installation procedures that were involved in that. So, yes, we do have people who go on site. We do have people who, who talk to the experts, and, and uh, we have prepared detailed reports on each of those previous outages and will in this case as well. Thank you, Mr. Firestone. I have also overused my time using the West Virginia clock. I just want to note that Clendenin time seems to be a lot like California time or vice versa. Uh, Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Firestone, is the uh, federal court action interfering with the ability of the FCC to fulfill its uh, oversight function? Uh, there has been uh, 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 a great deal of tension, if you will, uh, over the years between the court's day-to-day uh, -day involvement, if you will, in the operation of the industry and what we think uh, best promotes the, the public good here. Uh, and it, we think the uh, companies being involved in the manufacture of equipment, the development of software, uh, the companies being involved in the provision of information services, new sophisticated kinds of services to the public, the kinds of things that right now the court bars them from doing would very much be in the public interest. So yes, I think there is a tension and a conflict there. Does that equate to interference with your ability to fulfill your oversight function? Well, I don't want to suggest that the court is not fulfilling uh, what, is, what is legally a proper role for the court also. There is a conflict between those two roles, which ultimately the Congress will have to resolve. Well, I, I guess I mean, it concerns me the, the implication that, that the uh, action in the federal court, I mean, the implication is that the federal court is interfering with the FCC's ability to do its job. Now, there may be problems with, with the way the court gets involved in, in uh, resolving issues, but my, my real question is, is it somehow interfering with what you do, FCC does? I think the, the key is the limitations it imposes on what the companies are capable of doing, which our policies have determined would serve the public. So it's not that the court is taking action against the commission or preventing the commission from taking certain actions. It's that policies the commission has put in place and would want to put in place are limited in their impact in how much the public can benefit from them by their strictures that have been put in place by the court. So the, the court is blocking some implementation of some programs that you think would be good? Yes. With uh, the uh, recent outages that have occurred, have you, have you learned uh, some things that you didn't know before that have led to the, this four-part plan that uh, was released yesterday? Well, again, I want to emphasize this is a very preliminary point in our investigation. We have not concluded our investigation, determined root causes and things. But during the course of our review, in talking to various parts of the industry, I think one of the conclusions we reached is that there is inadequate communication among different parts of a very diverse industry. Uh, there is competition, as there should be, among various parts of the industry. Uh, there is a kind of jealous guarding of turf among parts of the industry, as in any business there should be. But when it comes to questions of reliability, network security and availability, and the interdependence of those networks since they hand off calls from each other, 
for example, uh, we think there is a need for greater communication, co greater cooperation, and uh, that has led us to uh, pr propose these additional steps, yes. Was, was that something you were not aware of prior to this, these incidents? I think it has been highlighted. It is something we have worked towards previously. Uh, there was uh, uh, another situation uh, dating back to uh, the last Super Bowl uh, as the, the time frame where there was going to be a promotion run uh, on national television that would have re resulted, according to projections, in a, a huge number of calls to a series of 800 numbers uh, as people try to, to get uh, to win in this giveaway. Uh, and there was concern in different parts of the industry there. The local telephone companies were concerned that some of their switches might be overloaded by people all trying to get through to these 800 numbers. Uh, what we found in that case was that the industry was not communicating well, that the long distance carriers had taken steps to deal with capacity, but they hadn't taken into account adequately the needs of the local telephone companies where millions of their customers might simultaneously lift their phones and dial the number. Uh, in that case, we called the industry together, uh, brought them into the FCC, a very diverse group of industry participants, and in a day-long series of meetings, they worked out some solutions to that immediate problem, which resulted in no harm to the network at that point, but then established a working group to deal with those kinds of mass call-in promotion kinds of campaigns to ensure that all of the carriers involved would have adequate facilities available to deal with them and that steps were being taken to minimize any impact. That was a step we took long before this incident, uh, but it suggested as we developed information about this set, most recent set of incidents that it was a model that could be useful here, in the, and that is getting the, the industry together under the auspices of the FCC and, and with our encouragement and oversight and ensuring that the kind of communication and attention that should be played to these issues, issues was being paid to them. So that step one would be a continuation of a process you've used in the past. It would be building on that, correct. Now, in step two, you talk about uh, accelerating commission research efforts and reporting on what you discover. What is it that was too slow in the past that will now be accelerated, if you know? Well, in this case, uh, in particular, uh, Mr. McCandless made reference to uh, what happens in an airline crash, for example. But we are looking in particular at, at situations in uh, uh, industries that are more like a utility-type operation, electric power, for example. And what, what kind of steps are being taken in those industries, both here and abroad, to deal with uh, outages, to both uh, uh, make that kind of occurrence as rare as possible and to minimize the impacts when it does occur and seeing if we can learn from those kinds of examples elsewhere steps that could be implemented beyond those already taken in the telephone industry. But the, these incidents didn't add any special knowledge with regard to those problems, did they? I mean, they may have emphasized the problem, but uh, I guess what, what, what my, all of my a series of questions, I won't go through the rest of these responses, but it seems to me that there, there are things out there that the FCC was aware of. The report uh, referred to in the testimony by Mr. McDonald has been out there for two years. Uh, it, my concern is that what this is is a response to a high, pub, uh, uh, high publicity. Uh, a cons this occurred uh, in, a, in an important uh, area of the United States. And we're, we're going to have these four responses that really don't change anything. And what we really have here is our movement as a country beyond our own technology. And, and I'm wondering, I mean, Mr. McDonald's testified that the hardware with the backup capacity that he's referring to is not, in fact, in place. Uh, because my, my, my next question would have been, if he had said it was in place, is where is the software? As I understand it, the, so the problem that happened here was software driven. At least that's the preliminary indications that it was software driven. And in fact, the software was, was uh, <clears throat> It, the, the problem grew upon itself because the same software was being used over and over uh, around the system. So if you did try to go around, you ran into the same problem once it was moved. If that all is correct, is there something the FCC intends to do in this instance that is related directly to the problems that have been pointed out with regard uh, to, to the uh, uh, outages that occurred here in the Washington area versus dealing with problems that you've known about for a long time and you're now uh, uh, expanding your efforts in those areas. 
Well, in particular, focusing on the, the uh, description, and as I said, it's a preliminary one, and I think you're correct in that, as to the causes and aggravating circumstances of these most recent outages, the software problems that, that have led to them. Um, the effort that we are talking about, bringing the various segments of the industry together and talking about what went right or wrong in the standards development process, in the testing process, what did some carriers know about the software operating in their networks and was that adequately communicated to others so that they could take protective steps in their networks? Uh, what was learned about one manufacturer's equipment or software that perhaps wasn't then spread in through the standards making process so that all providers of hardware and software to the telephone companies scattered across the country and in fact the world could learn from those experiences. So I think it is both building on programs we had in place before but very much targeted at what we know at this point were, were the circumstances of these outages and uh, what went wrong as a matter of policy, if you will, uh, that can be corrected to help minimize that impact. I, the only comment I would make, Mr. Chairman, and, and then I'll, I'll pass it back to you, is it, my concern, you read in your own uh, uh, re response to a question here, uh, a testimony from someone that we don't have uh, a lack of solutions, we, we lack the money to pay for the solutions. And my concern is that maybe that's true. And, and if it is true, aren't we all better off knowing that, honestly looking at what the problem is and proposing real solutions rather than suggesting we can have some meetings, we can accelerate what we're already doing, we can, we can do things that really don't deal with the real problem. And that is we're trying to f operate, and, and if this is true, and I'm not suggesting it is, but if it's true that we're accelerating beyond the technology that we have, if that in fact is true, we ought to talk about it at that level. Well, I don't think it's a fair characterization to say we are accelerating beyond the technology we had. I think it may be a fair characterization to say in some cases uh, adequate testing of systems may not be done before they are put in place. That appears perhaps to be one of the cases here as, as it has been discussed publicly already. Uh, it, it appears that uh, there is inadequate communication among some of the experts in the industry. And so th there are problems with respect to the implementation of this new technology. But first, it is, it is uh, I think, a, a decision that has been made uh, years ago. In fact, this SS7 uh, architecture has been in development for nearly 20 years, uh, has been implemented, in fact, since 1985 and is being rolled out over a number of years, it's not the kind of thing where the, the notion is, well, we can change our mind and go back. These are, in fact, worldwide standards for all communications networks, not merely even those in the United States. And so uh, it's, it's not a question, I don't think, of technology taking us forward. In fact, networks are increasingly reliable, and some of this new technology will enable us to better that reliability. Uh, some of the SS7 architecture being developed in the AT&T network, just as an example, is designed to root around cable cuts so that the kind of uh, event that happened in New York uh, earlier this year would be a matter of a few moments rather than hours to repair. Uh, that uh, software by AT&T, they have said, will be implemented by uh, the end of this year. Unfortunately, obviously, it was not in place uh, at the time of this fiber optic cable cut in January, but some of the new technology gives us capabilities to provide redundancy, rerouting, and backup that didn't exist under the old system. So it, there, there are a series of trade-offs, and they will be difficult ones over time, and yes, customers have to recognize uh, that as, as uh, uh, will uh, the government agencies and the carriers involved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cox. We've, uh, the subcommittee's been uh, joined by Eleanor Holmes Norton, delegate for the District of Columbia, whom I'll turn to in just a minute. And you've been very active in following the subcommittee and as we put together this hearing, and we appreciate your interest. The, um, uh, Mr. Firestone, I'm going to have, I have just a couple questions I think can be answered briefly, um, and they come from your testimony. You note on page four that the FCC has recently put in place a thorough and stringent monitoring system to measure the quality of our network of networks, and we will be vigilant in reviewing and acting upon the information we receive. My question is, when was the uh, monitoring system put into place? Uh, it was developed as part of the uh, uh, incentive regulation or price cap system put in place for the local exchange carriers that had been developed over the course of the last two years and was put in place earlier this year. 
was put in place earlier this year. Uh, I think it was at the uh, June meeting of the commission. Uh, June of 91? Yes. Um, in fact, I don't have the date. I'm sorry, no, it was the May 17th order was when it was finally implemented. It was announced by the Commission earlier that year. The final implementation steps were May 17th. And has there been any activity by this uh, uh, group uh, involved in the monitoring system yet? Well, there are two things. One, we require both quarterly reports and semi-annual reports. And if you count from May forward, obviously, we're not at the point of having gotten those first set of reports. Uh, completed yet. We have gotten the initial submissions by, by some of the companies. Those are being reviewed right now. Uh, in, it, it, I want to emphasize some of the, the benefits of this program will give us a baseline and then a way to compare over time whether, for example, amount of switch downtime, customer complaints, those kinds of measures are getting better or getting worse over time. Uh, and so the, the timeline of this reporting will be very useful to us, well, not merely an initial report. Is there, but I suspect in the first quarter report is going to be a pretty lively document. I uh, believe uh, that uh, in the descriptions that we will get, particularly focusing on the companies that were involved in these outages, it, it will be interesting to see the characterizations, yes. On page five and in your test, uh, spoken testimony, you note that uh, referring to the January 1990 software-related problem and a January 1991 fi fiber optic cable cut that impacted the AT&T long-distance network that the FCC issued a detailed investi investigative reports focusing particularly on the implications of these events for our nation's communication policies. Are those reports made public? Yes, they are. And uh, have they, they have been issued? I'll be glad to provide copies of the committee. Them. Yes, they, they have been public. And did they have implications for uh, what has occurred over the past month? Uh, there are uh, two parts of it. One, uh, in both cases uh, th that relate to this, to this incident, set of incidents also, again, the well, key fact was that these were part of network upgrades, not network degradation. Something went wrong in the implementation of the upgrades in the up AT&T network. That's what happened here as well. Uh, second thing that was relevant is the first of the AT&T outages that was discussed in one of those reports was, in fact, a signaling system problem. It did not involve the same equipment vendor. It did not involve the same software. There were a number of differences. But yes, there was a signaling system problem in that case uh, that uh, 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 was software driven that cr uh, resulted in the outage for that day of the AT&T network. So there are some parallels. There are some lessons that were drawn from them. Mr. Uh, Davenport, We've focused a lot on the Federal Communications Commission, and of course, uh, your Public Service Commission has uh, significant jurisdiction also over the CNP of uh, the district, as there is CNP of West Virginia and the other CNP systems. And we sometimes get, I think, into a cross uh, or perhaps conflicts of jurisdiction. And I would ask you whether you consider the situation such as what happened in these outages, particularly as it affected the District of Columbia, is this something that's strictly within the purview of your district, of your Public Service Commission, or is there, do you feel, a role for the FCC? There's a definite role for both the Federal Communications Commission and State Utility Commissions to play. We're talking about telecommunications equipment, which is involved with the provision of interstate traffic and intrastate traffic. So there is dual jurisdiction. In addition, quite frankly, the FCC has expertise, which you just, for the most part, will not find in state utility commissions, which is why we are, of course, working cooperatively with the FCC as the investigation moves forward. Do you feel that the FCC is uh, assertive enough in trying to work with the state public service commissions? And my second question really is, uh, uh, do you think there's some things the FCC should, could be doing to head off these problems such as we experienced uh, before they occur more so than what they're doing? From what I've seen, I think that uh, Chairman Sykes and uh, Mr. Firestone and other individuals are doing a, a splendid job of moving forward aggressively with the investigation. They have reached out and gotten the D.C. Commission involved and other state utility commissions. So at this stage, I have no basis to, to quarrel with the FCC's investigation at all. That's as far as the investigation after the, the event has happened. Yes. That doesn't go to the question of what could have been done perhaps to, to prevent it or whether there were some... Uh, uh, warnings along the road that could have been heated and the FCC could have played more of a role in, in uh, uh, disseminating. I don't want to say or do anything which would uh, impair the uh, competitive, I had a cooperative I was, spirit yes, in which uh, we're all proceeding. I had a feeling I was putting you on the spot. Uh, 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 finally, let me just note, um, 
we're not, Mr. Firestone, we're not going to resolve our, I think, some basic differences. I do note with interest uh, the FCC's opinion that, in, for instance, the cutting of the cable was a sign of progress and what happened was a sign of progress versus a sign of degradation of the system. I've got to be honest, when my long distance system went out that day, I did not stand up and say, hallelujah, it's progress and I'm so happy. Um, nor did I when the phones in uh, my state went down for, for seven hours. What concerns me is I understand progress. I got caught in traffic the other day as they narrowed four lanes down to do to re repave it. But I knew what was at the end. And I know that we're getting improved telecommunications, but uh, there's some concern that we don't know what's at the end, that there's not adequate standards, that there's not adequate attention by the FCC to network reliability, there's not adequate oversight. And so it's going to be hard to get people to accept the fact that we're going to have larger and larger outages and that what we ought to do is be satisfied that this is progress and so that that's a basic uh, uh, difference I think we're going to have between us for a while. Let me uh, turn to uh, Delegate Norton for any questions she might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for providing me the opportunity to participate in this morning's hearing. As a result of our own experience here in the District of Columbia two weeks ago, I have followed the developing crisis intensely. Our country is experiencing an increasing number of serious disruptions <clears throat> in telephone service which cannot be allowed to continue. Here in Washington, members of the public and the business community, vital government agencies and the Congress itself lost their primary means of communication. Clearly, we can no longer take our telephone service for granted. It is not a convenience, it is a necessity. For many, the telephone is a lifeline. Uh, <clears throat> this reality makes me uh, particularly uh, happy to be able to join the subcommittee's effort to see if we can find an effective solution to the problem. And I, as you might expect, have some questions for uh, Mr. Davenport. Uh, Mr. Davenport, here we are in a city where one would have thought that uh, this kind of emergency uh, might have had catastrophic effects uh, because while it would have been very serious in any community uh, for this city to be cut off in this uh, manner raises not only uh, normal uh, serious considerations but uh, considerations that may, might even go to national security considerations. I'd like your opinion uh, as to the amount of time, seven hours, it took to restore service in the district. I suppose I'm as concerned about the amount of time it took as, as I am about uh, the emergency itself. If it had happened and then it had sprung back, uh, I, I, would, I would be more, more likely to re regard this, Mr. Firestone, as a, uh, as a sign of some kind of progress that we'll get, get over in time. But the long time seems to me to raise very, very serious, um, to have very, very serious implications. I just think we're all lucky that at least we don't know of, of terribly serious uh, problems that resulted from the time. Do you think that the seven hours was uh, par for the course? Uh, can you explain why it, should, why it took so long? Do you think it should have taken less time to restore service? Given the unprecedented nature of the outage, there's no standard to determine, in the District of Columbia at least, whether the seven-hour duration is unreasonable on its face. However, I think in the district we're in the uh, unique position of being able to take a, a hands-on look at whether a backup system is going to be effective. Uh, that reason is very simple. In Congress Heights, in the Woodley section of the District of Columbia, they are not served by the SS7 system. They are served by uh, an analog system which is still in, in place and it's due to be replaced by the SS7 system in August of 1992. Uh, what the Commission is going to consider is, is whether when the cutover takes place it's in engineering sense and economically feasible to leave in the back room, if you will, the system which is currently in a place for Congress Heights in Woodley. So the, the short answer is that given the unprecedented nature of the outage in the District of Columbia, I have no basis to say this morning that uh, seven hours was just simply too long. However, we have a concrete plan to de determine whether seven hours is going to be too, too much in the future given the fact that we have a system in place now, the analog system, 
which is due to be uh, supplemented by the SS-7. Will that, will that system, uh, that so-called backup system, cover the entire city in, in the event of another such crisis? It would not. The system which is in place now only covers Congress Heights and Woodley. Uh, the SS-7 covers the rest of the city. CMP simply has not yet gotten around to upgrading Congress Heights and Woodley. That's the only reason that the uh, analog is currently in place for Congress Heights and Woodley. So they didn't experience this problem at all? Then. They did not because they're on a different system. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in, in terms of national security, uh, according to our briefing from CMP, there were no national security implications. Um, uh, Mr. Firestone, do you have an opinion on the, the amount of time um, that it took to restore service? Well, I, think, I think Mr. Davenport is absolutely correct, which is it's too early in the process to know whether all the steps that were taken were the correct ones uh, and, and such. Uh, it, this is a complex uh, system. It is a complex series of problems, and Mr. Cox was correct in talking about the cutting edge technology that is involved in uh, uh, the development of these networks. And so it is not something where a single technician goes out and, uh, you know, uses uh, uh, pliers and tape and can fix the problem. It is far more difficult to both diagnose and solve. Uh, one of the questions that we will be addressing is, uh, as I indicated earlier, not merely ways to to um, avoid these kinds of incidents in the future, but also ways to minimize their impact. And that deals with such things as how to diagnose better and, and s resolve better any outages in the future. That will be one of the uh, uh, tasks, if you will, of this inter-industry group that we're going to be bringing together. Yeah, I, I, in asking that question, I, don't, I do not mean uh, to imply necessarily that it was too much time. One can uh, uh, hypothesize, and indeed uh, there's, there's some information that makes me hypothesize that this may have been a heroic effort, given, that, given the fact that nobody knew what was happening or why it occurred. Obviously, you had to go through uh, a, a uh, hit and miss diagnostic um, um, procedure to find out. So if it, it may well be that seven hours was very good given where you started from. I just don't have any basis to judge that. The companies uh, did in fact take a number of steps trying different solutions in different parts of their network in Baltimore versus in Washington, separating the pieces of equipment and trying different solutions in each of them. And they'll be up here later so you can ask them directly about that. Uh, so I was not by any means implying uh, that there weren't uh, massive efforts by the company to, to try and deal with the problem. I was focusing again for the future on are there ways to build into the system uh, structures that will ease that task should they be confronted with it again. Uh, Mr. Davenport, are you uh, totally dependent upon the FCC uh, when it comes to a review of steps um, that might be taken to prevent the reoccurrence of this problem, or is uh, your commission able to yourself or in the process yourself of trying to uh, monitor and review and identify steps that might be taken? The D.C. Commission is not totally dependent upon the FCC. In fact, seated to my left is the Commission's chief engineer who is heading up the D.C. Commission's investigation. Secondly, the D.C. Commission will probably work in conjunction with other state utility commissions in investigating the situation. Uh, we have our national meeting coming up uh, July, beginning July 21st, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. And I'm certain that this outage situation is going to be one of the primary topics on the agenda. Is yours an independent investigation or your, is your, 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 your investigation tied into the FCC investigation? The, the short answer is that the Commission is working both independently and in concert with the FCC. The FCC has resources which they are willingly sharing with other state utility commissions that we frankly would not have. One more question, if I might, uh, Mr. Davenport. What, if any, action will the Commission take to ensure that uh, CNP's district cu customers are compensated for the loss of service they experienced if such compensation would be appropriate? That's a very tricky question in a sense that CNP 
would have to come before the D.C. Commission and request rate relief to the extent they have financial exposure, and then the Commission would have to make a determination as to whether it's going to grant CMP that rate relief. Keep in mind, if the Commission allows CMP the rate relief, then it's going to come out of the pockets of all District of Columbia constituents. Thank you very much, Mr. Davenport. Thank you. Mr. McCandless. Mr. Firestone, uh, we have a number of other panels, but I want to leave you with this one thought, and if you would take this back and share it with those in the ivory tower which, from which you come, and there are many ivory towers here in Washington, I don't want to single you out, that the, the time has come, and this has come up before, this committee's held other hearings relative to telecommunications, the time has come for somebody to decide who is responsible administratively for the operation of the telecommunications system. And uh, the fact that we have had a judicial management administration of this for somewhere in the neighborhood of nine plus years. And your answer is that it takes something here on the Hill to change that is accepted. But it also is a responsibility of the FCC now that we have a demonstrated need as you have testified, and as others have testified, and will testify, I'm sure, demonstrated need to put this back in an administrative context so that certain things that are necessary can happen without compromising the decisions that were made. Uh, that needs to take place, and I would suggest that the FCC do this while the iron is hot, and you can show examples of why you need to have this change. And, uh, Thank the chairman for his time. Mr. Cox. I wish to thank uh, both witnesses, Mr. Davenport, and we look forward to seeing you uh, uh, next time uh, uh, as uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Davenport. Uh, Mr. Firestone, thank you very much for your time. I'm, we are happy. The subcommittee notes that the FCC has begun to act in what I consider to be a constructive way. Uh, the results of the meeting last night, the steps that you've announced, my personal feeling is you can go farther, but this is a good first step, and I look forward to working with you in the future as we review these and work with you to, uh, to make sure the network reliability is an uppermost goal. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much. Thank you, Mr. The next uh, panel will be composed of uh, those in the industry that have been directly working with this, uh, this situation. The uh, Fred D'Alessio, Vice President of Network Operations and Engineering, representing Bell Atlantic. James R. Young, the Vice President of Regulatory and Industry Relations for Bell Atlantic. Ross K. Ireland, General Manager, Network Services for Pacific Telesis. And Frank Propelia, Vice President of Technology and Product Development of DSC Communications Corporation. And we have asked, uh, we're pleased to have joined the panel a representative of uh, the Belcor Corporation, John O'Rourke, the Assistant Vice President uh, for Switching Technology and Analysis. Gentlemen, uh, as you've seen from the previous panels, uh, it's a practice of the subcommittee to swear in all witnesses. If you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. I do. As has been the case with previous panels, we will include your written statements as part of the record. We appreciate uh, your being here. You can certainly bring a lot of uh, light to shed on this, particularly in light of recent uh, announcements in the last 24 hours about what may have been the cause of the outages. I think you can gather from the gist of uh, the questions and what this subcommittee's interest is, not only, of course, what caused the problem, what's being done about it, but from this subcommittee standpoint is what role uh, should the FCC be playing uh, in this, and how does the FCC work with you, and uh, indeed how could that be improved uh, if you feel it could be improved. At this point, why don't we just go in the order uh, of which uh, you're listed, and I'll begin with uh, Mr. Uh, D'Alessio, and my first question is, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, you did. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm here to explain <clears throat> what the Bell Atlantic telephone companies have done to diagnose the cause of the recent telephone service disruptions and to explain what we are doing to prevent future reoccurrences. These outages occurred because of problems in our signaling system 7 network, which you've already heard. Uh, in order to put that in the context, I would like to explain a little bit, give a little background about that network, particularly in Bell Atlantic. <clears throat> this kind of signaling network, which is based on national and international standards, was first uh, deployed by the Bell system in the 1970s 
the Bell Atlantic companies began deploying SS7 in our networks in the mid-1980s. The switches in the SS7 networks are called signal transfer points, or STPs. Each STP is actually two computers, each designed to process calls if the other fails. Because of the critical nature of STPs, we never rely on just one STP in any particular geographical area. Instead, we deploy them in pairs. Each one has sufficient capacity to carry the whole load. The pairs of STPs are located in separate buildings. That way, if one goes down, for example, because of a fire, the other will not be affected. In short, the system is designed with backup, and it's designed to be ext extremely reliable. And for many years, our SS7 network had been just that. I would now like to get back to the specifics of the service disruptions we had. In each case, there was the discrete event that triggered the service disruption. For example, in one case, an electronic circuit pack failure in Baltimore interrupted signaling links that connect several central offices to one of the STPs. I want to reemphasize re that the network should have taken such minor failures in stride, and it should have been totally invisible to our customers. At most, we would expect that anyone who was attempting to place a call at the instant the failure occurred might have had to hang up and dial again. But what did happen, as we have learned, is that instead of re automatically rearranging itself to bypass the failed component, the signaling network's management messages completely flooded the STPs so they were unable to process any messages. With the signaling messages between central offices able, unable to get through, inter-central office calling was interrupted. Neighbors served by the same exchange could still call each other, and calls to 911, although we know that they were getting many calls just trying to find out what, what was going on, those calls were getting through, and long distance calls were also getting through. Dial tone was slow at times because many customers were trying to reinstitute their calls. In each case, our technicians responded immediately to the problem and quickly called engineers from the DSC Corporation, the manufacturer of the STPs. In the end, just as one might clear all cars off a major highway that has experienced congestion after a major accident, we isolated the STPs from each other and the rest of the network and methodically returned central offices back onto the signaling network one link at a time. Once we had service restored, we reassembled we assembled teams of experts from Bell Atlantic, Pacific Bell, Bellcore, and DSC Corporation to fully analyze the problem. These teams, including other vendors that we have brought in since, have been active continuously since the initial failure. As I said, we are treating this as an industry concern. We are setting up a distributed testing laboratory involving Belcor in Morristown, New Jersey, DSC in Plano, Texas, AT&T in Lyle, Illinois, and Northern Telecom in Raleigh, North Carolina. <clears throat> the Common Channel Signaling Network is a distributed system that includes STPs and central office switches, all of which mu must work together and Belcor is coordinating this testing. While continuing to work with the task force to uncover the root causes, DSC Corporation has implemented a number of software changes to stop the proliferation of network congestion that we experienced. The most important of these was made last week and has to do with the way the STP prioritizes messages when it, f when it finds itself being overburdened. It is a standard practice in computer and software system design to have such a priority scheme. DSC has acknowledged, as you've heard, uh, that this was not implemented properly in the software we had in our SDPs at the time of the failure. We are at this point guardedly optimistic that the patches that have been installed in the software will prevent the network congestion we experienced which resulted in our failures. In fact, since last week, we have had several net network maintenance events and the signaling network was able to recover automatically without disrupting service. <clears throat> I would now like to discuss what we need to do to prevent future reoccurrences. Of course, it is natural to ask for assurances that will never happen again. First, let me acknowledge up front that disruptions can never be categorically ruled out in any complex system. We can, however, do everything possible to learn from any failure that may occur and implement specific action to guard against reoccurrences of that particular failure or any similar ones that we can foresee. Further, we must constantly assess and reassess the network architecture to be sure that all precautions against service interruption are being taken. <clears throat> Finally, we are confident the industry investigation and testing being coordinated by Belcor will provide network informa important information to ensure the reliability of our national SS7 network. I want to state clearly that Bell Atlantic feels fully accountable for the quality of its service. We are determined to leave no stone unturned in our investigations. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. D'Alessio. Uh, Mr. Young, uh, did you wish to make any additional statement on behalf of Bell Atlantic? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I will be very brief. Uh, what I wanted to do for the subcommittee this morning is to provide a brief update on an issue that has been raised uh, before this morning, and that's the interrelationship of this uh, outage problem and the modification of final judgment, in particular the manufacturing issue that's been alluded to. Uh, and to give you a status report of where that stands. Uh, I just note, I'm, we're happy to take that testimony. This subcommittee will not have that under its uh, jurisdiction. That's under the Energy and Commerce Committee. But if you think it plays a role, we're happy to, to hear that testimony. I understand that, Mr. Chairman. I, I simply wanted to uh, address the issue because it had been raised this morning in some questions, and I will be very brief. On uh, uh, the evening of the 4th of July, uh, I got a call at home from members of the uh, task force that uh, Mr. D'Alessio has described and others have described that has been working around the clock to try to find the, the, uh, the root causes of the network outage problems that we discovered. Uh, the, the gist of the call was this, that this task force in, the, in its efforts to sort through what had happened was going to be getting into uh, a very detailed review of the hardware architecture and also the line-by-line -line software code in the DSC STP, the specialized switch that Mr. D'Alessio has talked about. Now this uh, uh, was raised a decree issue for us because the decree court has told us that the scope of the manufacturing restriction is such that we cannot be involved in the design of uh, telecommunications equipment or in the development of software that is integral to that equipment. The, we, are, we take decree compliance very, very seriously. So this was an issue that was posed for me, a call at home on the evening of the 4th. I contacted the Department of Justice the next day, told them uh, we had this problem and that we would like their assurance that uh, as we were going through these, these activities over the weekend and around the clock that we would not have a decree problem. The Department advised us to write them a letter and that they would give us a letter back saying uh, they would not at least seek enforcement action against us for, for proceeding to solve this problem. Uh, we, I wrote on the uh, 5th, I got a letter back from the department that said they, this was a difficult decree issue and they could not give us any assurance, uh, but that uh, they would not seek sanctions. The following Monday, we got a call from the department that uh, they thought about this some more and they thought that in view of what we wanted to do, we had better go to the decree court to seek a waiver. So that night we wrote up our waiver papers and filed them with the court the very next day. This morning at 10 o'clock, Judge Green gave us a hearing and in that hearing he uh, indicated that we would be permitted to go forward with these efforts. He said uh, he did not give us the waiver. He said he would interpret the decree to allow us to do this provided we did not suggest any um, uh, additional features or functions or improvements to the software. So that's the status report on that issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ireland, uh, General Manager of Network Services with Pacific Telesis. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, uh, my name is Ross Ireland. I'm the General Manager of Network Services for Pacific Bell. And among my responsibilities are the engineering and operation of Pacific Bell's SS7 signaling network. During the past four weeks, Pacific Bell experienced several problems in its SS7 signaling network. This network carries per-call information needed to set up and disconnect calls. The information includes such data as the called and calling telephone numbers. These problems began on June 10th, and a second occurrence took place on June 26th. Two near misses occurred on July 1st and 2nd. I'm sorry. On each of these occurrences, a triggering event resulted in congestion in the SS7 signaling network, which on June 10th and 26th propagated to other network elements, ultimately resulting in service impairment to customer service. The triggering events were technical problems, none of which should have resulted in a serious service outage. The common problem the propagation of congestion and subsequent overload was the reason for the severe service impairment. On July 1st and 2nd, triggering events also occurred, but alert technicians and engineers were able to contain the congestion before the problem spread to other elements. 
Early last week, engineers were able to duplicate the congestion propagation problem in a laboratory environment. DSC, the manufacturer of our signaling switching equipment called STPs, has provided a software fix for the congestion problem reproduced in the laboratory. With this fix in place, the congestion propagation problem does not recur in the laboratory. We have applied this fix, this corrective software, in all STPs in California and have not experienced an outage since that time. Pacific Bell's analysis and research into the triggering events in California have produced no evidence to suspect sabotage or any illegal activity. Pacific Bell has taken extraordinary measures to engineer reliability and survivability into its SS7 signaling network. Examples of this are evident in the architecture and its implementation in the San Francisco Bay Area and the Los Angeles area, the two locations where Pacific Bell has deployed this technology. In both cases, we have deployed four rather than two STPs. Each STP is physically located in a different building about 20 miles from its mate STP. This provides a high level of protection against fire, earthquake, flood, or other disaster. Additionally, we are equipping each central office with four interconnecting links to the SS7 network. With this architecture, three simultaneous hardware failures would be required before any central office would be isolated from the network. Still, even with this very robust architecture, a software glitch slipped through and resulted in serious service impairment. In light of this situation, it is clear that even more robust and extensive software testing is called for and necessary. Finally, we believe it would be beneficial for us to be more directly involved in the design and development of critical network software, particularly as it relates to reliability, network management, and diagnostic capabilities. As the frontline operators of this equipment, we feel we would be particularly well qualified in designing this protective software, an area we are currently restricted from under the MFJ. Our goal has been and continues to be providing high quality and reliable telecommunication services to our customers, and we have an outstanding record in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ireland. Our next witness, and we will, let me just advise the panel, we will not be able to get through all of you before we go to vote. Uh, I thought, Mr. Papili, if you, if uh, uh, we'll take five minutes and hear your testimony, and then we'll hear from the Belcor representative when we return. Uh, and let me just ask you, though, in the nature, um, would it be better to hear, in your opinion, from the Belcor representative now, or to, to go ahead with you, or does it matter? Probably May 1st. Okay, fine. Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, first I'd like to thank you for inviting DSC to participate in these hearings, not only to discuss the recent events, but perhaps more importantly to discuss the more global issue that prior testimony uh, talked about. My name is Frank Perpilia, and I am Vice President of Technology and Product Development for DSC Communications Corporation. I am testifying here today about circumstances that all of us in the industry wish had not occurred. This has been a blow to us as a company and certainly to the industry at large, and especially distressing to us at DSC, given our historic success. Before I describe the recent events and what our companies and others involved have been doing to correct not only the problem but also to prevent a reoccurrence, I want to leave you with this important thought. DSC has taken and continues to take great pride in the state of the art products that we manufacture. We have been widely acknowledged on a worldwide basis as a technological leader in network products. Since in the past and now we have been eager to claim credit for our successes, we must also now be forthright in accepting our share of responsibility for the recent disruptions. We do that. DSC fully acknowledges involvement with the outages that are the subject of this briefing. Our equipment was without question 
a contributor to these outages. We have acknowledged our role in these outages to our customers, literally immersing ourselves for the past two weeks and helping resolve the difficulties while also working with others to resolve longer term issues. DSC has a stellar track record in manufacturing network switching and transmission products. Apart from our technological successes, DSC has strived to remain a uniquely American owned and independent equipment supplier. Our sales success, both internationally and domestically, have only served to reinforce our belief that our products and our corporate strategy are proper. We sell our products to not only Bell Atlantic and Pacific Bell, but also to other of the regional holding companies and Bell operating companies, independent telcos, long distance carriers, and various corporate private network operators. The centerpiece of our nation's rapidly evolving public network is Signaling System 7, or SS7. It is a state-of-the-art system that is bringing many of the information age services to the public at large. DSC products enable telephone companies to more efficiently and effectively deploy these services. DSC's main product in this area is the Signal Transfer Point or STP, of which we are the leading supplier. DSC, since 1986, has shipped and placed in a service in more than 100 units to over 20 different worldwide service providers. The various networks utilizing DSC's STPs route about 1 billion phone calls and many billion network messages each and every day. It was exactly this STP product that was involved in these recent outages. The STP functions as a traffic director, routing telephone calls to their destinations. Since it is the heart of the network, it will typically be the first to show symptoms of stress or failure. Continuing with this analogy, the outages occurred when the heart continued to pump, but pumped erratically. The reasons for this at this point in time are not completely known. But there are some issues today that we know better than we did two weeks ago, and even today we know better than we did yesterday. We have recently discovered, for example, that in the April time period, a modification to DSC, our software, was made, and this modification resulted in omitting algorithms which we believe were a contribution to the propagation of messages throughout the STPs. A broadcast warning by DSC was sent on Friday, July 5th, along with a software modification which we believe resolves the issue of propagation within the STPs. We believe that the changes we have implemented will prevent a reoccurrence of the congestion that contributed to the recent disruptions, but further other engineering changes that will be forthcoming and need to be forthcoming will further protect the network and provide additional network robustness. I hope that the subcommittee will appreciate the amount and the manner in which all the companies involved treated this matter. Neither my company nor anyone else here plans to tolerate outages of this sort. It is important, however, for everyone to understand, as we certainly do in the industry, the extreme complexity of these new systems where billions upon billions of bits of information and interconnections must be managed flawlessly. The SS7, we believe, is our future. Indeed, it is the infrastructure we must build upon to ensure that the U.S will continue to compete in worldwide markets. Major U.S. competitors such as Japan and the U.K. are rapidly deploying similar intelligent networks. As we continue to work towards a complete solution to local allergies of the type we recently experienced, DSC is hopeful that we will begin focusing on the larger issues, including the interoperability of individual networks such as those involved here. In an industry which has many suppliers of equipment and services, tightly coordinated network management, protocols, standards, quality assurance have never been more crucial. Before I close, Mr. Chairman, I would like to commend you in particular and the subcommittee 
for inviting Mr. McDonald to testify. There appears to be an insubstantial amount of attention given to looking at the future of a nation's telecommunications with the global view that he articulated. Mr. McDonald has clearly articulated a number of problems that we who are on the cutting edge of technology continue to be concerned about, and we believe it bears further exploration. Thank you. Thank you very much for your statement. Um, Mr. O'Rourke, uh, the subcommittee needs to stand in recess for 10 minutes to vote, and we will be back uh, uh, at that time. The committee is in recess. This hearing, this hearing of the Government Information, Justice, and Agriculture Subcommittee will resume when, prior to the recess, uh, uh, we had concluded uh, testimony from Frank Perpilia. Vice, Mr. Perpilia, am I pronouncing that correctly? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Vice President of the Technology and Product Development of DSC Communications Corporation. And our final testimony will be from uh, John O'Rourke, uh, representing the Belcor. Corporation. Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am John O'Rourke. I'm the Assistant Vice President at Belcor, responsible for switching technology analysis. My organization at Belcor includes more than 250 professional engineers and computer scientists. Uh, personally, I've been involved in this industry for 25 years, early in my career at Bell Laboratories, more recently at Bell Corps. I'm a member of several international committees in the switching industry, technical committees in the switching industry, I should say. Um, I don't have to tell you about the recent events. I think you've described them very well. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, Bell Corps and specifically members of my organization have acted in an advisory role to the operating engineers in both Bell Atlantic and Pacific Bell to investigate these incidents. Uh, Bellcor is also heading up a multi-company team of experts under my direct supervision to investigate all of these events and to recommend and test solutions designed to recover from the immediate failures and to stabilize the networks in the long term. Uh, throughout all of this period, while we've been active, uh, control of the local networks has remained in the hands of Pacific Bell and Bell Atlantic where it belongs. Uh, the team that I described is staffed by experts from Bellcor, DSC, Pacific Bell, Bell Atlantic, AT&T, and Northern Telecom. All of those companies came to my assistance immediately as I asked for their help each of them has put personnel and laboratories at my command. Uh, the team is working on a seven-day, 24-hour-a-day basis to understand all of these issues and resolve them. We will remain in operation until all of these incidents are satisfactorily replicated in a laboratory environment, permanent solutions are found, tested, and installed in the networks, and all parties are confident that we've restored long-term stability to the networks. We're also conducting a root cause analysis to assure that we learn every valuable lesson that we can from these experiences so that appropriate controls and technologies are in place to assure that these kinds of events cannot happen in the future. Uh, we've done another, a number of things since we got started our experts have been involved with both Bell Atlantic and Pacific Bell on site to diagnose uh, issues in those networks and restore service. Uh, we're creating, we're, uh, I should say we're accelerating uh, the interconnection of, an, of advanced switching laboratories at our own location along with AT&T's, Northern Telecom's, and DSC's. Uh, this cooperative test facility uh, which is up right now as I speak, uh, will be used to replicate the events that have occurred in the networks in a controlled laboratory environment to pinpoint exactly what occurred. And we'll use this network, this test bed, uh, for testing solutions under heavy traffic loads in real life network configurations and under various network management events. As I said, the laboratories have been interconnected 
Uh, we're currently working on configuring the hardware and the software of all of those interconnected laboratories to replicate the Baltimore SS7 network environment. And we're finalizing the test scenarios and developing the requisite test scripts to run the software in the test systems which will replicate those events. Engineers in all of the companies that I mentioned are coordinating our investigations and testing efforts and immediately sharing test results from the various laboratories around the country. Our investigation has proceeded along a number of lines. I'll mention just a few, but I want to assure you that we're keeping our minds open and looking at every possibility. But some of the things that we're looking at are whether there are any critical processing limitations in the specific STPs which are in the network, which might cause it to become prematurely congested, either under normal busy traffic conditions or under normal traffic conditions with the combination of network management messages. And we're looking at whether those kinds of loads can place these machines into congested states. In fact, I have a team of experts uh, cooperating with DSC in Texas right now uh, walking through uh, the architecture of the STP and its software to understand exactly the traffic control and congestion management uh, uh, capabilities. We're also looking at whether there are any unknown previous interactions in the protocol handlers of the various machines in the network during these events. Uh, we've also been looking at whether uh, security is an issue. At this point, we don't think it is. Uh, but I want to assure you that we're looking at that as well as all the technical areas as well. I want to talk just a little bit about the SS7 protocol. It is used worldwide in every advanced telephone network in the world. It's been used since the mid-70s. It's very well known. It's been studied throughout the world, and it continues to be improved. As these events occur, we learn uh, from time to time additional aspects of how SS7 networks may have behaved in congested situations and improvements are always uh, being studied uh, in laboratories around the world and we're taking advantage of that. I, I want you to note that the SS7 protocol establishes an architecture which has built into it numerous congestion control mechanisms Error, error detection mechanisms that allow for messages to be retransmitted when they're corrupted. And it allows for immediate reconfiguration of a network to take advantage of, uh, of redundant architectures at several levels within the network to assure that the network performs under any condition. Now, you can always add more and more stages of redundancy. Uh, I've looked at some of the networks that are in place right now and I'm impressed with the levels of redundancy that are in the network today. Uh, we've heard uh, talk about additional backup systems. In my view, backup systems have to be consistent with the, with the SS7 protocol architecture. To attempt to introduce a backup system of a completely different architecture uh, would, in my view, be very much like using the streets of downtown Washington as the backup system for the interstate highway network. So we have to be very careful about introducing redundancies into this network. Uh, I would suggest again that it needs to be done within the framework of the SS7 architecture. And in fact, uh, we are looking at alternatives for doing that right now. Um, you've heard uh, reports today and, uh, and over the last week about some of the results of our investigations. Uh, some particular software uh, uh, issues have been found and replicated in certain laboratories. Uh, we believe, however, that we're not finished our investigations yet. We have to understand exactly why the STP went into congestion in the first place. And as I said, this requires a very detailed examination of both the hardware design and the software operating system of the STP. As I mentioned, we have a team of people in Texas doing that right now, and we will make any recommendations that we're allowed to make. We'll have to study 
uh, the advice from the court this morning to understand exactly what that means. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to assure you that this effort is receiving the highest priority in Belcor. I have not only the engineers under my direct supervision, but I have all of the resources of the company at my disposal, as well as resources in many other companies. I'm reporting daily to the senior officers of all of the companies affected, including my own. And in fact, I'm in almost hourly contact with, uh, with those senior executives. Uh, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. I was struck by a word you used, Mr. O'Rourke, when you said congestion, because uh, for a moment I had, it sounded like a heart attack. But in some ways, this was a heart attack in that there was a sudden overload of signal uh, going to a, to a central organ, and uh, the system broke down. But uh, to clear up something I, I have some confusion on, um, yesterday, Mr. Propelia, you stated, and it's on the front page of the Washington Post today, that uh, there was a software bug, as it, as it was quoted, um, three faulty computer instructions uh, in software that DSC fields caused the outages. Is that a correct statement? Because my question is, is that the, the only cause? Uh, have, in your opinion, then, have you resolved this? Because I don't hear that coming from Mr. O'Rourke. Um, that is a quote. It is not a complete representation of what was discussed. And let me dwell on that for a minute. Um, there are several issues that we're trying to get our arms around. Um, one is the overall network issues and the events that occur and how congestion can be initiated and how it can be propagated. What we do know, looking just within the STPs, and that was the comment that I had made, what we do know, looking within DSC's STPs, is that in the April time period, we sent out a system which inadvertently had three bits turned off. Those three bits controlled congestion algorithms and in fact, therefore, made those algorithms inoperable. Therefore, the result of handling congestion within the STPs had the effect of propagating that congestion instead of handling them more properly. We still don't know what the source of the congestion was, the originating uh, trigger event, and the cause and effect there. But it is true that within the STPs, the event that occurred that caused congestion was those three bits, yes. The event that caused congestion, but the root cause, you still have not been able to identify, have you? Once again, within the STPs, we believe that is the root cause. In the overall network, we still don't know what those events but were. But something sparked it somewhere in the network. That's correct. And, and we're, I'm sorry, and we're go still ahead. looking and investigating those events and the effects that they had. And am I correct that in the outages that occurred with, between both Pactel and Bell Atlantic, that there may have been different problems within the network that sparked what happened in the STPs. That is correct. That is known that they were differing events that occurred. Okay, let me turn to the Bell and Pactel people just to ask whether my analysis so far is, or my summary so far is good. Yeah, yes. Um, as I mentioned, and I think Mr. Ireland mentioned, in each of our cases, there was a trigger event, something that occurred in our network that should have been handled normally by the, uh, by the logic in the software. In our case, uh, one trigger event was we had a failed circuit pack. This occurs all the time, okay? In a, in a vast network, you, you uh, frequently lose equipment like that. In another case, we had a problem with a timer, a clock that keeps track of what time it is for all the equipment to simplify it. Uh, so we know what the trigger events were, and we know that the software, uh, those trigger events developed some congestion in the system that uh, Mr. Papillion discussed. Where, that's where the software comes in at that that's point. Right. That's the right. That's where the software comes in. The software is component. designed to uh, contain the congestion, and as Mr. Papillion mentioned, it did not. So we, we understand what started it, uh, a, a more or less a, a normal event started the, the problem but the software is designed to rearrange it. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we've had several cases over the last week since the corrections have been made to the software that uh, in some cases have been similar to the trigger events that caused us our problem, but now the system is reacting um, the way it's supposed to react. So there are really two 
sets of events here. One is a trigger event. Absolutely. And then you get to the STP, and then the STP is, is performing in a that's, faulty manner. That's correct. Now, in, has Bell Atlantic identified all the trigger events? We know what, what the trigger events were. In each of your outages? E in each of our outages, yes. And we know, um, we've looked at each of them, and I guess what I would say is they're unremarkable. I mean, they're normal kinds of occurrences. Uh, but Mr. Um, O'Rourke's uh, views, I think, are significant because he, he feels, and we feel as well, that we want to thoroughly understand why those trigger events caused the congestion that should have been corrected by the, by the software, okay? Are you suggesting that there could have been a trigger to the trigger? Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is if you think about this in kind of three steps, trigger event causes congestion, software is supposed to contain the congestion. We know that the software didn't contain the congestion. Okay, that's the problem that, that they found. And we understand what the trigger event was. We're still trying to understand how that trigger event resulted in congestion. It may be normal. It may not be normal. That's the part that Mr. O'Rourke and his uh, laboratory is investigating right now. Let me ask Mr. Ireland whether uh, that is the same experience with Pactel. Uh, the experience in Pactel is the same. However, the triggering events, we believe, are in some cases different than those that actually took place in uh, Bell Atlantic. We have, in fact, looked at and identified technical problems of one sort or another that were responsible for each of the triggering events similar to the circuit pack, the clock timing issue. The clock timing issue actually occurred to but us you, as well. But did you have the DSC software in your STP that, that acted in the same manner as what uh, Bell Atlantic thinks it did? Yes, that's true. Okay. My question then comes, if you know the triggering events, or you feel you do, and you feel that you've identified the software problem, can you now conclusively rule out any question of sabotage a uh, computer virus or some kind of uh, hostile intrusion into the system? I wouldn't want to completely rule it out, but at the same time, everything that we have looked at, all of the research that we have done to try and see whether or not there was anywhere in the system that we feel such an occurrence took place, we have not been able to find any evidence that that was the case. So all of the investigative work that has been done up to this point in time does not suggest that computer virus um, or sabotage or any other illegal event was responsible for any of the triggering um, events that started these outages. Accepting for the moment of purposes of discussion um, that the software, the DSC, has conceded uh, had some defects in it uh, at the ST point of the STP, but going back to the trigger events, it's of interest that there seems to have been a curious coincidence, uh, frequency of these outages all at one period, and indeed I think according to one report at least I saw several of them occurring at the same time of day. Why would there be the same, why would triggering events, even different ones, be occurring in that, that kind of pattern? Yeah, we, we don't know at this point. Um, we too are concerned about that and have been concerned about that. We've involved our internal security organizations in that. We've involved outside agencies in that. But let me also reiterate that all of the research we have done would indicate that these are uh, technical problems and not ones associated with sabotage from all the evidence we have been able to see thus far. Mr. Rourke, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think you very correctly tried to separate root causes, triggering events, and software faults. We've seen as Mr. D'Alessio said, a number of different triggering events occurring at different times of day. The ones that made the front pages occurred in busy traffic hours. Um, I believe these triggering events have tended to concentrate heavy traffic loads and network configuration messages in the STP. The STP itself in isolation, then begins to go in, we begin to see overload phenomena in the STP, and then the normal congestion management uh, techniques to contain that congestion from spreading through the network fail, apparently because of a software fault. Now, we need to recreate all of these situations in the laboratory environment to understand 
every step along the way how that congestion occurred and then spread and make sure that we've solved it. You bring, you add an, an element that I think Mr. Uh, um, uh, D'Alessio was referring to, triggering event and software, but prior to the triggering event is a root cause. You remarked, uh, Mr. Uh, D'Alessio, that these triggering events were ordinarily routine functions, uh, a circuit pack uh, uh, going out. Have there been these type of triggering events occurring in the past few months without the result that we saw at the STP? The in other words, I assume that you've had these routine events going on uh, for a period of time with the, the defective software in place and yet not had the results that we've seen. Is that correct? We have uh, not been able to identify any triggering events that occurred while we had the, soft, the, the faulty software in place, and that was for only about five weeks in Bell Atlantic, uh, that resulted in the problem, um, in answer to your question. So I can't go back. We're still looking at this, Mr. Wise. We're, we're still looking at this, but we have not been able to say there is a triggering event that occurred at a point where, after we put the faulty software in that did not develop into a problem. We're still looking at that, and that's still part of the investigation. Mr. Ireland, what about Pactel's experience? Uh, we, too, are still exploring this, but what we do know is that in one STP in the Los Angeles area, we installed the new software approximately in the March-April time frame in one STP. So we had the older software in the other three. We did not load the new software in any of those other three units until June 7th and 8th of 1991. So at the point in time where we had three machines on the new software, again this June 7th and 8th date, we experienced our first problem on June the 10th with an experience that took place there, a triggering event. So perhaps only two or three days. Uh, my final question in this round, Mr. Propelia, in were there any other failures of the SS7 system prior to the recent outages we've discussed here? For instance, were there failures in the lab? Um, not to our knowledge, no. Not in the lab nor in the field? Um, we're always in the laboratory uh, stressing and putting in tests to test the viability of it, but uh, we had not experienced SS7 difficulties prior to this event. And this you might not even call an SS7 difficulty because this was an omission on our part in terms of not handling according to the SS7 protocols. This change that we made in the software omitted algorithms which are a part of the SS7 protocol. Mr. McCandless. Thank you. Uh Mr. McDonald, were you gentlemen in the audience when Mr. McDonald uh, gave his testimony? Were you in the audience when Mr. McDonald gave So you're familiar with what his statement yes. was. Uh, Mr. McDonald commented that he felt that there would, uh, in the direction in which the industry was taking relative to its routing, relative to its uh, overall design, that maybe we were, these are my words, accumulating too many, too many eggs in one basket which perpetuated the problem when a problem began to take place. And we have, we have a, an overall network design, A, then we have the equipment that goes into that design, B. In this case, the SS7 is evidently kind of the, the uh, reliable, proven, unit that everybody is using, do I understand correctly? Uh, and, and since 1973, Mr. O'Rourke said it went online, if I get your, did I write 73? I would put it more in the 1976 time. Okay, fine. That uh, there have been upgrades along the way to make it perform uh, more admirably. <coughs> and that uh, what we did here was an upgrade that didn't perform more admirably. Is that a fair statement? It was not an upgrade to the SS7 definition or the SS7 architecture. It was the, an upgrade to the specific implementation within a specific 
STP. So there was no change in the definition of the SS7 uh, <coughs> architecture in the April time frame. A specific implementation to a specific STP. Correct. Now, other elements. Pactel in the had it on the west coast, and uh, well, the companies had it on the east coast. Uh, so it wasn't a specific location. Oh, I, I'm sorry. It, um, there are many providers of STPs. It's a competitive industry. Uh, what we've talked about here is a specific software upgrade to the DSC STP, which was installed in the various DSC okay. STPs right. in those networks. Six letters is not right. Yeah. Uh, Chairman and I would agree that six letters is about our limit, fellas. So, <laughs> um, in in this uh, report that uh, Mr. McDonald referred to, growing vulnerability of public switching networks, under the title of switching in page 25, it, it talks about two different kinds of switching, and he refers to uh, an Illinois type where it's concentrated uh, super switches. It's referred to. And he gives an example, or, or the, the people who wrote the book uh, give an example of the Hinsdale, Illinois program, and then they go on to talk about the STP program. If I understand the switching section of this book, we have different modes being used by different companies other than the STP system as uh, in, 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 in a modernization framework, or are we talking about uh, two separate generations? Uh, Mr. Ork. I think we need to distinguish between um, what you called earlier as substations, uh, we would call central offices, um, or another term for it is end office. That is the switch that concentrates uh, the traffic from the 20,000 to 60,000 subscribers who may be served in a particular area of a large city. Um, there are uh, many different uh, versions of that central office switch. There are many people in that industry. That's also a competitive industry. Uh, I'm sure there must be at least a dozen uh, varieties of central office switch operating in the networks today. Um, now we have to distinguish those central office switches or substation switches from the STPs which are part of this signaling highway that interconnects all of those switches in a very flexible way. Um, the chairman earlier talked about the uh, the signaling network as essentially being the scout that goes out to look for a route between these central office switches. Uh, so the point is both of those areas, the STP arena and the central office switch arena are competitive areas where there are, e <coughs> uh, are equipment from a multitude of suppliers in the, installed in the various networks today and you'll see various generations of it. At the time in 19... Yes, yeah. Mr. Maybe, maybe one thing that might be helpful here is the network is always in a state of evolution. A um, long time ago, whenever you wanted to place a call, you had to get an operator on the line because it wasn't automated. And then we automated that capability using some technology that we called electromechanical. The network is very large, and so the process of evolution takes place gradually, so that at any point in time you may have two, even three or more different types of technology being used. SS7, I believe, is going to be the international standard for signaling between central offices. And what you are seeing right now is a, a period of evolution where many companies are partially equipped with that technology, but still have some of the older technology in place. And we are in the process of transitioning from that onto the new technology. I guess what I'm getting at here is uh Coming in another life, I dealt with uh, automotive equipment, uh, trucks and buses and that kind of thing. And we avoided some manufacturers' components because it didn't seem to make any difference how they were placed in their use 
they had certain glitches in them to begin with, and if you ordered a certain type of rear axle or transmission, uh, you knew what you were getting, and it didn't seem to make any difference year after year. It stayed the same, even though the manufacturer attempted on a couple of occasions to maybe correct some of these things. It still had its basic components that had been, for some reason, engineered uh, not quite the way they should have been. Are, is there a parallel there in this type of uh, equipment? Are we using band-aids here to something that maybe shouldn't go back and and uh, redesign? I don't think so, uh, Congressman. Um, I think we heard earlier about uh, the very wide deployments of uh, DSC STPs, uh, not only in the Pacific Bell and Bell Atlantic uh, networks, but in many other places as well. Uh, we don't have uh, a long history of the rear axle falling off, uh, so I don't think that's a good analogy. I think that what we're dealing with here, well, I, I don't want to be too quick to say that we have the problem, uh, but what we have at this point is clear identification of an isolated fault in the software which may have uh, been just a one-time error in the coding process and testing process in delivering that software to the field. Uh, so I, I don't think we're in a position here where we can say that the rear axle is falling off of that machine repeatedly. Uh, in fact, uh, history shows it's quite the contrary. So I wouldn't make that analogy at this time. In, in Pacific Bell, we have a very rigorous procurement process so that when we go out to purchase equipment from manufacturers, and in this case there are several manufacturers that make such equipment, we look at a variety of different things, including the features, the capacity that a manufacturer can provide, but we also look at the service they provide, the reliability and the quality of those products. And when we went through that type of procurement process in Pacific, our belief was that DSC makes the best product that was available for our particular application and that they were, in fact, a high-quality provider. Um, I think it would be premature because of one event that we have found in their particular product to now assume that all the wheels and all the tires will fall off everything that they build. My personal opinion is that they are still a very high-quality provider and it's very unfortunate that we have had this one event. Now, if I understand correctly, you designed these STPs for the load that uh, comes from, quote, the substation, unquote, and that if we're talking about Wall Street, that would be a different design than if we were talking about uh, a beautiful town in West Virginia or any residential town. And so uh, you have different capabilities. Am I on the right track here? According to the, the peak loads and the, uh, the, the level of use, is that a fair statement? Well, now you're talking to an engineer, and I'm going to go down to another level of detail. Um, we're not talking about a fundamentally different architecture between Wall Street and West Virginia. But what, uh, what you do see is a difference in the number of processors available within the architecture to handle the load. Components, then? Yes, okay. yes. So right, there now, are load-related okay. components. Now we, we've... Uh, We've got these components in place, and we've got one that's going to take 60,000 calls, and we've got one over here that maybe take 40,000. And yet it's the, it's the one that seems to uh, have had its maximum uh, period of the day use that created the problem in an area where evidently the use is greater than a residential area, if I understood your comments correctly. Is that is that? Uh, correct uh, assumption that the problem seemed to center around a high use level at a certain peak period of the day? Several of the events we observed were in peak traffic hours, uh, but I must caution you that the, uh, the kind of error that existed <coughs> in the software could have resulted in spread of congestion at almost any hour of the day if a triggering event occurred. Uh, now, it's my information that since this uh, particular 
uh, software error has been uh, restored that uh, we have been containing. We've seen con uh, trigger events of sorts at, uh, at low traffic hours that uh, did not result in spread of congestion through the network. I would, uh, uh, one of the things I want to look at in my laboratory environment as I recreate these uh, events is to understand uh, more precisely uh, the relationship between traffic loads and the appearance of these congestion events. Well, now, now comes the $64 question. Have you ever tried to call somebody on Mother's Day and to give equal time, Father's Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and the circuits will all be busy? And usually these calls originate from one of these lower level uh, STPs which are designed to handle residential areas. And yet uh, the breakdowns do not seem to happen during that extraordinary type of activity that, quote, the system may not have been designed completely, unquote, to handle. And so my question is, uh, how, do, how do we reconcile this kind of a situation? One, one of the things that we have now seen which I think proves that capacity by itself is not an issue, is on June the 28th, with the fault still in place, we did not have the software correction at this point from the manufacturer, we had a 6.0 earthquake in Sierra Madre in Los Angeles. The network traffic was about twice what the normal traffic is. And in fact, there were problems in completing calls in Los Angeles during this period but they were not in any way related to overload of the signaling network. The signaling network performed well and processed all of the messages given to it during this very significant earthquake. So it, it appears to us that you must have one of these triggering maintenance events, perhaps with load as well, but you must have one of these triggering maintenance events before you got in a situation where the software problem that DSC talked about caused this congestion problem to exist. The chairman has been very kind with his West Virginia watch. I have one more question. The panel may answer it as they wish. Is it possible that we are trying to extract too much in the way of additional services and offerings from a merchandising point of view from this 1976 upgraded unit uh, without taking into consideration that the unit needs to have some more added to it rather than what you currently have. Are we going too, too far, too fast, and as a result, certain things are beginning to appear? Again, if, if we're going back to the DSC equipment, which I think was your, your point in the question, um, I think um, this was a specific instance. It was a specific omission of code and a specific omission in testing that, that should have been performed by the vendor in this case that they've, uh, they, they've admitted has been the problem. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's related to going too fast. Uh, I think it's related more to tr better understanding what happened, and we think we have a very excellent understanding now of what happened. Uh, setting up the uh, laboratory environment that Mr. O'Rourke discussed so we can, we can absolutely watch the occurrence in a laboratory environment and understand every element of it and then deciding afterwards what we as an industry uh, need to do uh, going back to Mr. McDonald's uh, view about the backup for example um, perhaps we as an industry, after we look at all this, have to decide whether our backup facilities that we have in place now, which, which we all thought up to now have been absolutely uh, robust and as robust as anyone could expect, um, need to be modified in some way. So I think that's really the, the uh, exercise that the, the engineers that are looking very hard at this whole situation from a, ne a network and from a national perspective are looking at right now. Sir. Anybody else here? I would just add that SS7 technology was uh, conceived, designed, and developed uh, years before any thoughts about any new services that it might uh, 
enabled to happen. And the fundamental drivers of SS7 technology worldwide have been to improve the processing efficiency and the reliability of the telephone networks. Uh, I just want to go back briefly to the fact that it incorporates a, the ability to very rapidly reconfigure the signaling networks to assure that the events that normally occur in a telephone network have no service impact. What we're looking at in these instances are, I, I believe, may very well turn out to be some very unique circumstances that found, as, uh, as you heard earlier, a couple of lines of code that were an error in a specific system. And we, and we know how to correct that. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I want to pick right up where you left off, because that gets back to the central theme, I think, of this hearing. Uh, which is relating to the Federal Communications Commission and backups in case of these type of situations. Because there can be a root cause, a triggering event, root cause, triggering event, uh, software problem. And it seems to me there are an infinite number of possibilities about how that can happen. But then the key is what happens when it happens? How, how can you avert that problem? Not <coughs> Mr. Uh, Propelia will go back and DSC will correct that software problem. But somewhere else, as, you, as we develop technology and move on, there's going to be another problem and another problem. Just yesterday in North Carolina, MCI uh, lost uh, 92,000 long distance calls. Uh, so there's another significant outage, uh, all t uh, technology based. And the question then comes, what kind of backups are available and what role does the Federal Communications Commission have in working with you? So let me ask you some questions on that. For instance, when the first outages occurred, is at what point do you notify the Federal Communications Commission? Do you want to take that, Mr. Let me take that, Mr. Chairman. We notify them immediately. Okay, uh, and is this is the uh, the one the seven hour outage uh, that affected Washington and the uh, the other states? Yes, uh, I uh, learned of that uh, outage. I think it was a few minutes to noon. Uh, of course, we couldn't call over to the commission, so uh, we we. Uh, uh, sent a person to, to go over and, and talk to them face to face. I was over later that afternoon. The very next morning, Mr. D'Alessio was over there for several hours to give them a detailed briefing. Uh, Mr. Ireland, what about uh, Pactel's reaction? Um, I, I don't specifically know at what time the FCC is notified in some of these events, but I can tell you that I have been in constant touch with the FCC we have been talking through all of the details of what has happened in all of these particular outages. I have also talked to them personally, um, in many cases in the middle of the night, on circumstances that have taken place in California. Mr. O'Rourke, you uh, head up the task force that's looking into the cause of these problems. What role does the FCC play in that? Are they, are they uh, an active participant? Are they physically present uh, with your research teams? No, they are not. Now, are they invited to be? No, they are not. Um, I guess I, I don't understand at this point what, what role they would play in the, in the simulation of these events in a laboratory environment. Because is there not uh, an advantage to having the Federal Communications Commission, which is charged with maintaining a national network, uh, in at every stage, uh, so well, that in case something does develop, that, yeah, we, that we, we certainly, has a relevant role? We certainly share our findings. But it's, it's not clear to me at this point that with the kinds of activities that we're engaged in, of constructing laboratories, developing test system software, running tests, uh, that, that there's a role there for the FCC, I'll certainly take your advice. Have, have they expressed any interest in participating? Not directly to me. Are you aware of whether or not they have expressed interest? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, the, um, but I, I just have to keep coming back to this question of backup, that there are going to be a significant number of problems as technology develops. And the question then becomes whether there's adequate backup. We can get into cost-benefit analysis and whether or not that's worthwhile. But when you have millions of phones going down seemingly uh, on a fairly frequent basis, um, then that, that raises that question. The, the um, Mr. Papilia, you have spoken, I believe, about a software patch. 
in which uh, you developed on July the 5th in response to the f recent outages. Now, you, I think you heard my analogy of this, the, uh, the out-of-band bound signal system in which, as I understand the present SS7 system, there's a, there are really two bands and the, what I call the scout goes out and finds the, the channel and then, and then directs the uh, communication through it. Am I correct that the patch that is Im uh, imposed corrects the problem by, in effect, telling the telephone company to disregard the data channel, the scouting channel? Um, not, no, not completely, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, the SS7 protocol has many, many, many uh, attributes and variations associated with it. Um, the propagation of congestion within the STPs was defective. We have yet to repair that piece of it because that's just one piece. We focused early on to ensure against the reoccurrence of the events while we continued to investigate all of the causes. Okay. The patch that we submitted is one that handles messages in a way that prevents cues, which are the mechanisms within the STP, to eliminate overflowing of those cues. So we because it's the overflowing of those cues which is the vehicle to propagate congestion within the STPs. So what we implemented was a fix such that cues could not overflow. Therefore, propagation of messages would not happen. Under the software patch, and let me just check, is this a patch that both Bell Atlantic and Pactel now employ? That's correct, yes. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Under this, though, do you lose the benefit of the what's known as class features, C-L-A-S-S, the caller ID, the other features? Uh, no. So they, they are maintained even though the, p the p patch is applied. Well, I should, I should uh, defer to uh, some of my colleagues here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me s see if I can explain what the patch does, at least from my understanding. Um, in normal situation, the, uh, the SS7 network are processing calls. They're setting up calls. In the situation where we have an event where, in these cases we've described them as trigger events, where the network has to reconfigure, for example, in an event where, let's say, from one central office, um, we lost the link to one of the computers. What that computer then does is it says, it tells the other computer, and it tells that central office to send calls to the other computer. So it now has to process messages that are not call messages. At that instant, the most important thing for it to do is to reconfigure the network. Okay? So there are, that's, in that case, we would call reconfiguring the network a higher priority, really, than processing the next telephone call, if you can understand that. Now that's oversimplified, but, but let me use that as an example. There actually, actually are several layers of priorities. Now what the patch, what the software was, was supposed to do was when that event occurred, it was supposed to tell the processor to start prioritizing messages and disregard the messages that are low priority. And in, many, in some cases, it may actually be a, the next phone call. What the processor should do first is to reconfigure the network. That's the most important thing for it to do and get done with that so the network can then go ahead and process calls. What was happening, it wasn't uh, prioritizing anything. It was trying to do everything that was coming along and the traffic of messages was much higher because it now went into this program that said we have to reconfigure. We have to reconfigure. Um, what the patch did is it went back and it said let's prioritize these messages. Now I don't think it's it, the patch has done that in the in what we would call the elegant way that we would like it to do but it's doing it. So therefore when, when a reconfiguration is required uh, it, it uh, discards messages so that it can set up the network fast and then get back to serving, uh, serving real calls. Had it been necessary... Does that, oh. does that help? It helps some. I, okay. uh, what I understand is what I don't understand. <laughs> um, Mr. Papilia, uh, had there been previous instances when you had to recommend or uh, patches similar to this prior to uh, this uh, group of outages? Yes, uh, in some ways, yes. Um, the change that we made, uh, 
that's operable now is um, a variation of SS7 congestion control mechanisms. Within the SS7 <coughs> definition, there is no provision to discard network messages. The problem of propagation of messages then is a question of mix of messages. How many messages are call messages versus how many messages are network messages? Under the SS7 protocol definition, since the algorithms don't permit the elimination of network messages, then it is possible if all of the congestion is a function of network messages, then we would have a similar occurrence that we just recently experienced. The patch that we put in is in some ways a violation of that very specific piece of SS7, which then will discard network messages. Some, it is true that some of our customers in the past have requested of us that that be effective in their systems to eliminate the message traffic in their systems. So they had in effect requested the software patch that you've described is applying to these other outages. I'm sorry, I missed and that. So they in effect requested the same type of software patch that we've been discussing. Is that correct? That is correct. They requested that implementation, not as a patch, but that implementation. And had yes, they done this because of previous failures? Their experience in their own testing environments made them feel more comfortable under that environment than under what might be a congested environment. That's and correct. Would, and would this, the requesting of this by uh, your customers, uh, did all this occur after April? That is when you made the changes to the software or did some of it occur before April? No, sir. That's been a relatively speaking long-term um, installation of some of our customers, nine months to a year. So it was before a this April? That's then. correct. So is it safe to say then that there was some indication of problems uh, coming from your customers prior to April and prior to these outages? I'd say that as perhaps a previous uh, testimony has indicated, um, there are questions about the ultimate completeness of SS7. And as um, Mr. O'Rourke talked about, it is a constantly evolving thing and something that we learn from all the time. Uh, this is an instance that we are learning from. Um, the issue of whether um, requirements from one set of our customers is different from requirements of others is real. Some of our customers are not demanding adherence to the standards at 100 percent. And that's the instance that you're talking about. Other customers demand adherence to 100 percent. Well, I would assume that in the case of a Bell Atlantic and a Pactel, which are very large customers and, and servicing millions of people, I would assume that that uh, they would have a great interest in, in uh, any kind of problems that had been reported. Uh, uh, they've certainly concerned about outages. Did you report to them the, the uh, uh, changes that you were making in the software, the patching that was being done for other customers? Uh, as I say, because it seems to me that there's some indication of problem coming from somebody prior to April. Now, let, let, me, let me correct that. Uh, the instance of the initiation of this in other carrier systems was not a result of their experience of problem. Mm -hmm. It was a result, this is a variable. The, the patch that we put in is a variable in setting a timer. And it's a theoretical argument and a theoretical design issue that some of our customers felt one way and some of our customers felt another way. Uh, and it was not because some of our customers experienced a problem, we put in a patch. No, sir, that was not true. So the patch was done to meet their needs, but not to correct a problem. Is that your testimony? My testimony is that the patch was done at the request of customers who, when analyzing this specific area of SSC, SS7, felt strongly that we should implement it a particular way and not another way. I can tell you're from Texas because you're talking about SSC also. Um, uh, Mr. O'Rourke, uh, Belcor establishes standards for the SS system, SS7 system used in the United States. Am I correct in my statement? Well, 
Um, SS7 is really defined in a very open standards uh, process involving CCITT as well as domestic standards groups. Uh, it does leave some options. Uh, Belcor does, in fact, uh, pin down some of those options uh, where necessary on behalf of the local exchange carriers that we serve. But our, uh, my impression of Belcor is that you, in effect, are the standard for the industry. Well, my lawyers will never let me say that we well, do standards. I understand standards that, but, <laughs> but the reality is uh, uh, the practical. The, we, the practical. We, we develop requirements, sir. We develop requirements. So yeah. I'm very comfortable with the word. And are you confident that these requirements uh, include adequate testing? Excuse me. Are you confident that the requirements uh, slash prep standards include uh, adequate testing, testing of the the uh, uh, software? Um, I was very, very confident, um, but uh, we're, uh, we're learning from this incident as well as from uh, other incidents that have been reported in the press over the last year and a half uh, that there are some aspects of testing uh, that weren't adequately addressed in the past and that we need to improve in that area. I mentioned earlier that uh, we'd had cooperation from AT&T and Northern Telecom in assembling a nationwide laboratory to help replicate these problems. Fact of the matter is we started building that laboratory uh, back in January and February of this year uh, because of a concern uh, that we needed to do more extensive interoperability testing among SS7 protocol machines built by different suppliers. And in fact, earlier this year, uh, we'd, uh, we'd actually put that laboratory into service uh, doing testing between several uh, different vendors' products. Uh, now, uh, based on this uh, lesson, uh, there are additional test cases that we believe should be run on a periodic basis among the uh, SS7 machines of different suppliers and it's certainly our intent uh, to keep that laboratory in place on a going forward basis and in fact uh, as this crisis abates uh, we'll be looking uh, at whether we need additional test configurations and laboratories available on a full-time basis uh, to support the interoperability testing, again, among products of different suppliers. Let me ask a general question, uh, or that is to the panel, and anyone who wants to take it on can. Um, my fr going to the Bell Atlantic, or to the uh, regional operating companies, who in each, first is who in each company assesses the technologies, designs the regional network, uh, architecture plans, and negotiates the specifications for STPs and other network equipment. Is there a specific department in each of your companies? In our company, that would be uh, my department, the engineering department, Mr. Wise. We have a new technology introduction organization that looks at a vendor's technology, tests it very thoroughly, and approves it for use in Pacific. That is also done in an engineering department it is not specifically in my group, but I do not deploy any technology that has not been approved by them. But my question then becomes is uh, uh, what role do state and federal authorities have in this process? If you're designing a regional network, uh, uh, negotiating the specifications for STPs, uh, an FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, once again, is charged with maintaining a national telecommunications network. What role does the FCC play as you go about designing your regional systems, uh, your, your, your ba the basic guts of your operation, the STPs? Mr. Uh, anybody want to jump in on that? Mr. Young. Let me. Um, I, I, our role with our commissions is to keep them informed of what we're doing. Uh, for example, earlier this year, the FCC uh, devoted uh, I think it was a full day session to uh, uh, a hearing on networks of the future. Where are we headed with technology? What are we deploying? As I think Mr. Firestone indicated too, um, we have periodic meetings with our commissions in which we explain here's where we're going with our technology, here's the old technology that we want to retire and that the period of time over which we want to retire, 
and here's the new technology we want to replace it with. So we do, we do keep them informed. But that's, that is in the context of the rate process, isn't it? Not, not, the, the latter portion, uh, Mr. Wise, is, is in connection with our depreciation rate setting process, not our rates to end users. And that's a, even if we're not asking for new rates or additional rates, we still come in uh, uh, asking for changes in our depreciation. So that's an ongoing thing. But is that more a function for the Federal Communications Commission or the State PS Public Service Commission? Is that more a function for the accountants to be involved with than the engineers? Are they actually evaluating what you're doing, uh, seeing whether it's something uh, that's workable? How does it tie in in the case of the FCC with the overall national uh, telecommunications network? Uh, I'm afraid, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not prepared to address what the FCC does internally, but uh, the, the kind of people we talk to at the Commission are not just the accountants, they're the engineers too. Anyone else care to uh, respond? Mr. Ireland? Well, I can't speak specifically to the FCC. Um, however, I know that we have periodic meetings with the local California Public Utilities Commission. We meet regularly with them approximately every two months and we review with them all of our network evolution plans as to where we're going and exactly how we propose to implement. So I know that that activity takes place, but being in California and being in the role that I'm in, I'm not the direct uh, interface with the FCC. And uh, what would be my final question is, and the question I've asked uh, uh, the FCC, the report, uh, Growing Vulnerability of the Public Switch Networks, are, is, are your companies familiar with that? And did you play a role in uh, formulating it? Uh, and did you react to it when it was, uh, when it was issued? Uh, I'm not personally familiar with that, and I don't know whether or not anybody in our company is. Uh, I, I as well am not personally familiar. I didn't read one of the thousand copies that were issued. Um, but I am uh, generally familiar with, with, the, with the concepts, and uh, I agree with some, and I, I think perhaps uh, some are oversimplified. Mr. Propelia, you particularly referenced the report. I was interested in your remarks. I, I take it you are familiar with it, then. Um, I don't recall having referenced that report, but... Uh, well, well, Mr. I'm sorry, you referenced Mr. McDonald, who was, I the, did. Who yes, was I did. Uh, the chair of the uh, group that wrote the report. H his remarks have given me incentive to read it, but I have not... I have a feeling that there point. may be a new printing uh, coming up pretty soon, <laughs> hot off the press. Um, the report, is my closing re remark, the report title, I think, says it's a growing vulnerability, and... Um, it would seem that some of the observations in the report and some of the suggestions a couple of years ago have been borne out uh, in terms of as we move forward and as we become more technolog technologically based, we also become in some ways more vulnerable and how our ability to respond to that is going to be, be crucial. Um, I appreciate your all's role. In fact, uh, Bell Atlantic was very helpful in, in my local area in assisting uh, me to understand these issues better and particularly how they affected my state. I know that some of the other companies here have been uh, helpful to members uh, helping them. But this is a question I think that goes beyond the, the private sector and it goes to the FCC and to the State Public Service Commissions is what guarantees, if we're truly to have a national system, a national network, uh, within, what guarantee, how is it that that's going to be regulated? And I'm concerned, for instance, when I hear that the FCC is not even participating in a task force that I think is just crucial to understanding what went on. And I'm not, I don't know whether that's because you didn't invite them or the FCC chose not to come or they chose not, chose not to ask. I have a feeling if the FCC chose to ask, they'd be there. Uh, that, um, uh, but I'm concerned when the FCC isn't, isn't even at the table. I'm happy that the FCC has announced the steps they're taking, but I'm concerned that it took these outages to get them there. It's, it uh, seems to me that communication among the various uh, uh, companies is crucial and that uh, the FCC can be facilitating that. So uh, with those remarks, I want to say thank you for your patience and also for being here. And we look forward to continuing to work with you. Mr. McCandless, any? I have no further okay. we, have a, uh, uh, we have a final uh, witness, uh, Mr. Weintraub, is he here? Good. Uh, and I thank, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, the thank previous you, panel. This is where I really get wild. Remember the five minutes.
First, as you've seen, I've sworn in all witnesses. If you'd stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I appreciate uh, your patience. Our great concern, quite frankly, was that there would be a 911 emergency uh, that you'd res have to respond to. Um, but uh, thank you very, very much for your uh, uh, endurance. And I would urge you to uh, uh, summarize your statement in any way you wish, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, on the day of the occurrence of the outage, sorry, on the day of the occurrence of the outage, uh, our volume of business on 911 more than doubled. And I've spoken to my contemporaries around this region of the country that was also affected, and they experienced the same thing. There are a couple side issues that came along because of the outage. Uh, we have a standard operating procedure where if we do not make voice contact with a caller, we will call them back. And if we still don't make contact, we will send a police car or some type of assistance. The problem was we couldn't get out because of the outage. We could, we could receive 911 dial calls, but we could not get out to check on the uh, truthfulness of a lot of the 911 calls that came in. That became a very large problem for us, but we did find a way around it. There is one observation that uh, I had during the testimony of some of the other people before me, and that is at the present time before the uh, FCC, there's a docket on TSP. And I know it's not related to this, but it deals with setting up priorities for the restoration of telephone service in the event of national uh, or a natural disaster or any other type of thing. My concern is that 911 restoration is near the bottom of the totem pole. And in my opinion, it should be much higher. Uh, if there were a natural disaster in this area of the country, the citizenry would normally call 911 before they would call anybody else. But yet, as I understand it, the FCC's plans are not to restore 911 trunks before others. And it's the only observation I had on that. I would consider the, the Montgomery County, Maryland uh, 911 system, emergency system, probably as um, uh, thorough as any in the country. Uh, is that a safe assumption? I, I hope so, yes. yes I, th I thought you might agree, <laughs> like to agree with that. Um, is it w exactly what was the status during the outage? Uh, were you knocked out or? No. We, we were receiving 911 dial calls when people could get dial tone. Uh, what happened was that people who couldn't get dial tone to get out of their central offices would call 911 just to see if the phones were working or to ask us what the problem was. Or they would call, see that they could get through, and then hang up. Uh, this created a burden on our working staff, of course. It also may have prevented us from handling true emergency calls in an expeditious manner because these uh, quote unquote junk calls were coming in. So a secondary but expected result of an outage is that even if you're not knocked out as far as calling 911, you're going to call it to see if it's still intact in case you have a problem. That's correct. And is there a danger then that these calls clog up the system? Absolutely correct. And so that if I called 911, that um, uh, it's likely to be busy. Now, are there not, uh, are there not different types of 911 service? Uh, for, yes, there is. And could, could you uh, basically explain those? Uh, there are really two types of service throughout the United States, basic 911 and enhanced 911. Basic 911 just more or less trades off the various seven-digit numbers in a uh, geographical area for one number, 911, and it has some other features. Enhanced 911 gives us the telephone number and the name and address of the subscriber of that particular phone who places the 911 call, so that if a person placed a call from uh, 127 Main Street, telephone number 555-1234, that would flash in front of the operator. We would know that, so that if we can't make voice contact, we can send help. Basic 911 does not give that. One of the other advantages of enhanced 911 is it operates off of tandem trunking, and it is separate trunking, not part of the telephone company's normal network, and will come into us regardless of the failure of the SS7. We would still get it. I'm not sure that would happen with a basic system. 
You talked briefly about the FCC and the PSC. Uh, is there anything you can recommend that they could do, particularly the Federal Communications Commission, to uh, help the 911 services operate in a better manner than uh, uh, we've seen so far in crisis situations like this? Put us higher in the priority system for restoration move, of services. Move you up the ladder, huh? Yeah, move us way up. Because this seems to illustrate once again the dilemma, which is it's very likely with the development of technology as we move along this course that you're going to see problems like this develop. Uh, we're human and when you've got software with millions of items entered into it, the question is how do we handle the emergency when it arises? You, you're certainly in the emergency business, but, uh, uh, but in terms of a telecommunications emergency, how, how able are we to handle it? and then also to expect the kind of uh, ramifications such as what you experienced. Well, uh, in the past when we've had problems with 911 networking in Montgomery County and in other jurisdictions, we can get the telephone company to put out a public service announcement giving a seven-digit number that they can dial to access the 911 center. In Montgomery County, we do have a, a method whereby if somebody dials 911, and the 911 system is out, it will divert to a seven-digit number and come to us via that number. But is that a routine system uh, throughout the country? Uh, I can't say about it throughout the country. And I just wondered if you had any communication with some of your colleagues in smaller counties and more rural counties yes, as sir. to uh, what happened to them. Yes, I, I talked to the people in the uh, Baltimore area, and their experience was just about the same as ours. Uh, double volume of work. Uh, complaints from the public that they couldn't get through with a bona fide call because the lines were clogged. Well, we thank you very, very much uh, because it's, your testimony is an important part of this record in analyzing what are the results. This concludes this part of um, uh, the investigation by the Government Information Justice and Agriculture Subcommittee. I think it's important to note that uh, there will be future hearings and exploring the ability of the Federal Communications Commission to respond in these types of situations, what steps they are taking, and of course to monitor that which they've announced. My concern is that all the predictions in here have not, and all the concerns have not been met in this uh, report titled, entitled Growing Vulnerability of the Public Switch Networks, and it's an area that uh, looks to me like we're going to have to be spending an increasing amount of time on all of us, uh, private sector, public sector, uh, and, and consumers. With that, uh, this hearing uh, is adjourned. That concludes our coverage of this hearing on telephone service reliability. For more information, write to the subcommittee at B349, Rayburn House Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. This program note, Tune in to C-SPAN 2 Sunday evenings for coverage of the candidates and potential candidates for the 1992 presidential election. Road to the White House airs Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 3.30 Pacific, here on C-SPAN 2. Recently, C-SPAN's Viewer Information Department received these letters regarding our 1992 election coverage. I just saw an ad for Road to the White House. I'm glad you have this program. However, I did not...